two types of people in the world, right? There's the person doing it and there's the person talking about it. The game is so much bigger than just making money. It's your health, your family, mm. your faith, and you can make all the money in the world, but if you're fat and out of shape, I wouldn't trade places with you. At this point in my life, any skill I want to learn, I'm either going to hire somebody to teach us it or hire somebody to just do it for us. There's a group of people that are only interested in investing in themselves, and that's where you want to be. For anybody who's trying to make money, the first thing you got to do is stay where is the blue ocean? For us, I think the blue ocean is an e First of all, I want to ask you, what position did you play when you got drafted by the A's? Were you shortstop? Second base. You yep. said I played second base. What was that? What was that like? Man, dude, I mean, I was a baseball player my whole life, so yeah. I didn't know any better. I wasn't an entrepreneur or social media guy. Did you, did you, uh, I, was, I, I like to ask questions that nobody's ever asked. Did you, what, at what point did you know, man, I might get drafted playing baseball, right? So like, are you in junior high, you're in high school, you're just throwing people out from across the field? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? Are you significantly better than everybody else in your junior high team is what I'm asking. Yeah. 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 So I was always the best player on my team. Yeah. You know, I mean, my freshman year of high school, I was playing short, batting third. Yeah. You know, so like, it was always... Like a dream, yeah. And then, and then in college, and so are you? Are you getting drafted? Like you, because you, you go to Cal State Northridge. Are you getting yeah. drafted first, uh, or like how does it work? Because I know, like, so for instance, a lot of really great baseball players never played any college. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how does it work? Yeah, the really talented guys go straight out of high school. Yeah. Um, unless you're going to be in like the top five rounds, you should not go out of high school because yeah. I mean, once you go, you can't ever go back to college or anything. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't um, at that level out of high school, but, you know, I had a full ride to Cal State Northridge and, you know, went there and my freshman year, I was an All-American. I was the player of the year freshman year. Is so. this, is Cal State, is that D1? Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. Yep. So in the big West with um, all these other Cal State schools like Fullerton and Irvine and Long Beach that, you know, are traditionally good baseball schools. Yeah. And then you uh, you get drafted by the Oakland A's junior and year. What yep. is this? What is this feeling like? Explain to me because I, I mean, imagine at this point because you're not trying to be an entrepreneur at this point. Yep. This is before the couch flipping, way thing, before, right? Yep. Uh, imagine at this point you're like because uh, so I never thought about joining the military when I was in high school or in college. Never thought. And then I joined the military. I never. My dad was a he worked in finance. I ended up being a stock option seller. Like mm, okay. I ended up doing almost exactly what my dad do, did, except he was doing it with annuities and insurance. I almost do it exact, but at the, no point in my life was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. At this point, I'm pretty sure you're thinking I'm playing pro baseball. Like this is all I want to do for the rest of my life. What is this feeling like getting drafted and then then go through that whole that whole arc? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, right? Because my freshman year of college, like I said, I had a lot of success. And so I was really high on like, okay, this is one of the top freshmen in the nation. He could be a potential really high round pick. And so, you know, I ended up playing in the Cape Cod League, which is like the the most prestigious baseball league. It's where every first rounder would go. And I did super good my freshman year. So I'm like, dude, I'm about to be the man. This is great. Sophomore year, kind of get cocky and have a sophomore slump, right? Mm. And so I'm like, dang, dude, like, all right, got to humble myself. And so then I go into my junior year and, you know, play well. Um, Can I'm, you yeah, be specific? What do you, what do you attribute this to? I'm, I'm having trouble hitting a, be as specific as you can. I can't hit this curve. Like you're Mike, oh, Mike, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, really fast running bases when he goes plays for the Birmingham Barons. I was uh, fascinated by this idea that the greatest basketball player in the world wanted to go play baseball. And he goes there and, and I'm reading the scouting reports on him is like way above average speed. Cannot hit a curveball. Yeah. You know, what, what was, what was what the scouting report on Brian Panetta? What's going on there? Um, I think my junior year going into the draft, I had speed. I actually was second in stolen bases in the league. Um, I actually had power too. I led the league in home runs, mm -hmm. um, but I was already kind of maxed out. I mean, this size you see me at now, it, it was what I was. So right? there's, a, there's, there's no D ball for. <laughs> yeah, like that. There's no, and you know, with metal bats in college, yeah. it's easier. So yeah. like, I think the scouting report on me would have been, you know, yeah, he might be able to hit. We'll see yeah. with the wood bat. Um, defense was subpar. Um, speed was okay. Hitting was good, you know, so he's going to have to hit yeah. his way through the minors right. to get up there. Wow, okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah I was always wondering about that because I'm listening to this story and like you have to understand for the 99% of the population, we're not getting drafted by the Oakland A's. Yeah. And so I always, it's always interesting to me because whenever you see a guy who plays even D1 college football, he was the best player on his junior high team. He was yeah. the best player in high school. He played both ways. Yep. You know what I'm saying? He was the best fielder. So it's always interesting like when you get to that point, I have a friend of mine, Um, he played, a, uh, he was in high school, he was incredible. He goes and plays D1 basketball at Liberty and he's like an incredible shooter and then he realizes, oh wait, I have to guard people. Yeah. I have no chance 
chance against these athletes because yeah. these guys are incredible. And there's this moment for me, it's in high school. Like I can't, like I'm just not big enough to play offensive line. And when I get to college, because I just know that transition is not going to happen for me. Yeah. Well, I think what happens is each step of the way, you kind of get hit with a new reality yes. check, right? So it's like, all right, we go into high school. You're like, oh, dude, these guys are four years older than me. You yeah. know, these seniors. And so you got to prove yourself. And then yeah. you get into college and you're like, wow, all these guys are the best players in their high school, like nationwide. This is crazy. Then you get into pro sports and it becomes even different because not only are these the best players in high school and college, but they're the best players all over the world. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden we're competing against these Dominicans, these Venezuelans, these Mexicans, these guys who literally have nothing to lose. This yeah. is it for them. If they don't make it in baseball, they're done. There's yeah. nothing, there's nothing else. And so, man, dude, you see that level of competition and that happens every step of the ladder in the minor leagues. You're like, all right, cool. These are the guys in rookie ball. These are the guys in a ball. And you're like, you just realize how good people keep getting at every level. And that the reason why I also wanted to bring that up in that whole arc is because this is what you see in business. Like I, you really think you're doing something yeah. and then you meet somebody whose sales team is so much more dialed in than yours, whose ad spend, like they know exactly what they're doing. They're A-B testing everything. And oh, you're like, yeah. whoa, man, I thought I had, I thought I had this figured out because I've made a couple of funny uh, TikTok clips, you yeah. know? And then, and then you get into this situation where like these people are, again, I, I love like, uh, you know, I'm friends with Wes Watson and Wes Watson, like, yeah, 3 million a month with no ad, with no, sales team. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. And you think you're doing good. And then you like listen to Hermosi's numbers or you listen to like, you talk to, uh, uh, you know, I was with, uh, uh, not Ryan Stewart, um, Dan Fleischman. I was at his, his birthday party a couple yeah. weeks ago. And you like, you see this ranch. It's like, oh yeah. And it's, Three million, three hundred thousand a month to, for upkeep. I'm like, good <laughs> God, bro! You that I had Neil Patel over here. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to. I spend about three hundred forty thousand dollars a month on me and my family. That's like, I don't write any of this off. And you know, I'm trying to bring it down to like one hundred eighty thousand. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. And then you kind of realize it's the same thing. You get to the next step, and and even in business, like you you don't even realize how far people are gone. Yeah, yeah. Neil called me the other day because he was selling his twenty million dollar home. He's like, what do you think I should do with the money? I'm thinking about ten thirty one and into real estate, and yeah. I'm like you can give it to me. We'll go buy some other stuff. Yeah. And it's just like, he's like, yeah, you know, I'll sell it. I still got another $20 million home over here. Like yeah. it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk to Neil, yeah. it's so crazy when you talk to Neil. He's like, yeah, this is because he, he talks about it's a game for him. It's like people who make more money, people are better at the game of business. He calls it the game of business. Yeah. I heard, um, I, maybe I heard you, but I heard Hermosi say the same thing. And I wonder if maybe they got it from the same place, but they talk about the game. Anyone who's making more money than you is just doing better at that business. And there's no reason for you to hate them. It's just try to learn from them. Yeah. Well, I think um, for me, you know, you mentioned the podcast, The Wealthy Way. A lot of people play the game of business and it's like, all right, you know, the, the game is judged by how much money you make, right? For me, uh, that's not really what I'm after. I think money's going to come as a byproduct of doing the right actions over and over. But you know, the game is so much bigger than just making money, mm. right? It's your health, your family, mm. your faith, and all these other things that, man, dude, you can make all the money in the world, but if you're fat and out of shape, I wouldn't trade places with you. For sure. You know, so there's a lot of different games people play. Yeah. And so I just try to play the game I'm currently in. Cole Hatter talks about make money matter. So yep. making money and then using that in order to help some sort of philanthropic thing. By the way, uh, next week, we're, we're or this Saturday, we're hosting an animal rescue charity over at uh, the Ahern. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're raising money for uh, a Foster Friday Foundation. And the idea that like using your connections with these huge influencers in order to raise money, that's something I like. Mm. Uh, and then, and then you know, like you said before, uh, Ty Lopez, he was on here and he would say, I, I have several friends that are billionaires and I wouldn't trade places with any of them. Mm. And uh, Ty Lopez is obviously very wealthy, but in his situation, he's like, there's no balance. And like you said before, being in shape, yeah. Like how, what if you're if you're going through you know kidney failure and you're a billionaire? Like, what is that worth to you? Now like, you'd give it all up. Yeah, you could rebuild. You, yeah. But you know, it's funny as you mentioned all those guys and they've all spoke at um, my event. Mm -hmm. I hold an event called WealthCon, and so Neil was at one this year. Hormozy was. Um, who else? Cole Hatter speaking at mm -hmm. the next one. Dan Fleischman speaking at the next one. <laughs> like, they're all. I mean, they're all ballers, man. I've talked to Wes Watson too, yeah. and so he's going to speak at one. Uh, be ready for Wes. I know. Well, I'm like, I, you know, I, I don't cuss at all. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. We'll have to see. Uh, you mentioned before, uh, Brad is one of my good friends. And yeah, I brought uh, Brad too. Yeah. And Brad, uh, Brad Lee, he was like, yeah, I heard your wife's not a big fan of me because of the cussing. And I, the funny thing is Brad's wife is not a fan of me because, oh. because, and it wasn't, a, he, she got it wrong. I don't think women should be doing OnlyFans. 
But we had a discussion about the business model of OnlyFans and what it's doing to the dating market. And I was like, there's these people out here who are living at home making $300,000 a month filming with their, with their spouse. And I wasn't saying it was a good thing. She sees the clips and she's like, I can't believe you had this guy on the show. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, that's not what I said. That's yeah. not what I said. Like yeah. my girlfriend doesn't do OnlyFans. Like, that, that's not the point. But it's really interesting because you said that because uh, you said that your wife does like all the cussing with Brad. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you with Wes. He goes on stage one time. This is a story I've heard this from Wes and I've heard this from uh, uh, Ryan Stewart. He goes on stage one time. He goes, he goes, I'll take your effing wife and I'll like, I'll kill you mother. And I'll take your wife. He's on stage and he goes, and I got the paperwork to prove it. Cause he was, a, he went yeah. to jail 10 years for attempted murder. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, could you imagine? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like Wes, Wes communicates in a very different way. So yeah, that's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. Um, yeah. Brad's not that, that extreme. Yeah. Yeah. He but, doesn't serve time. Yeah. Brad, <laughs> that, I know of. that he, you don't know about yet. <laughs> Um, so here's the thing. Let's uh, let's go to this. Uh, the first thing that you do that's viral, um, and we all had like one thing. It's funny because you know, you have like a guy who's like maybe a gambler, and the first time he he hits it big, it like gets him hooked into the whole thing, right? Yeah. And for me, it's like the first time you do a couple of interviews or you have a clip that goes viral, you're like, oh wait, I can do something with this. The first thing that goes viral for you that I still don't even fully understand is the idea of you flipping couches. Mm -hmm. At first, I thought it was it was a metaphor for something. <laughs> There's a deeper meaning. Yeah. So so when we're doing when I'm doing research, I have two researchers and myself. We're doing research for this. Uh, you know, fresh and fitter friends of mine, and um, and then, and I'm watching this thing where you're talking about flipping couches, and I'm like, well, okay, is this a metaphor for something? But no, you're literally buying couches off Craigslist, mm -hmm. washing them, and then reselling them. Entrepreneurs, if you want to grow your business, there is no better investment than your own personal brand. The smartest thing I ever did was start creating content and investing into my brand. Ever since then, we've been able to triple our business. I've been able to raise more money than ever to continue buying more real estate. And it's all because I create content just like this. Now, a lot of people have asked me, Ryan, how am I supposed to do it? I don't know where to start. I don't know who's going to edit it. I don't know even what kind of setup or camera or anything to do. Well, here's the thing. We can help you with all of that at Pineda Media. We have a podcast checklist that you can actually get for free at PinedaMedia.com that's going to go over everything you need on starting a podcast. But to make matters even better, we'll actually edit your podcast for you. We'll repurpose it into short form clips like you see on my Instagram and my TikTok so that people will start seeing those clips and watching your podcast and in turn being customers or investors in your business. So if you want the one-stop solution where you can get everything done for you, plus get the education you need to grow your personal brand, then you need to go to PinedaMedia.com and book a free call with our team. You can also go get that free podcast checklist and that training program absolutely free by just going there. So go check it out. Like I said, I was in minor league baseball and yeah. people don't know, but you know, you, you don't make any money in the minor leagues. Sure. I was making literally $7,000 a year. We're in single A at this point. Yep. Okay. $7,000 a year was my paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so I needed a job in the off season. And so... 2010, I became a realtor, hated it. You know, the market was really tough. You know, these houses you see today selling for half a million bucks, they were a hundred grand back then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you try and make a commission, you, you'd barely make anything. So didn't like being a realtor. Well, I get married um, in 2013. So I got married super young. My wife just turned 21. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, I guess I got to be a provider now. And you know, I can't just be this guy making no money. And so we move into our apartment together and you know, I'm just, I buy all the furniture on Craigslist mm. because it does all we could afford. Anyways, I'm looking at the furniture one day and I'm like, man, I got such good deals on these. Like I've always been a little hustler. I, I used to flip cell phones and other things too. I was like, I bet you that couch I just bought for a hundred bucks. I could have sold that for like 400 if I yeah. really wanted yeah. to. And then it just clicked. And I was like, why wouldn't I just do that every day? That, that would make way more money than what I currently do. And so I tested it. I went and bought a couch made a couple hundred bucks. I was like, dude, this is a business. So ended up renting out a storage unit, bought a little truck for $1,500. And then I was like off to the races trying to flip anything and everything. Wow. That's awesome. Now the, in the situation you mentioned before, like you would wash some of you just strip the, the, the covers, cover, the covers yeah. off and you'd wash them. And then you just resell it again, yeah. which is funny because we're going to talk about wholesaling in a little bit, a yeah. little bit, which reminds me, it feels very similar, yeah, or some sort of value. Any it definitely kind of value prepared arbitrage. me for it. Yep. Um, and then you end up going viral from mm. it, and it do you go viral like it's unironically viral, or are people just like shocked by how well this works, or how you mentioned there's also Facebook groups where people are now still. 
couch flipping. Yeah. How does how does that whole situation work for you in the beginning? Well, so I did this for a couple of years yeah. and ended up maxing it out to about eight grand a month net. Mm. And so I was like, dude, this is great. And eventually I get into house flipping later on. And I'm like, all right, no longer do I need to do this because house flipping's now making way more. Sure. So, anyways, I get into content in 2020 because everybody's locked up during the pandemic. Yes. And I'm like, what am I gonna make content about? And so I'm making all this real estate content and everything else. And one day, as I'm brainstorming, you know, this week's ideas, I'm like, all right, what can I make a, a video on that people haven't heard before? And I was like, man, I used to do this couch flipping thing like five years ago that was, I bet it would help somebody if I just talked about it. Yeah. So sure enough, I make this freaking 15 minute YouTube video. I'm just like, all right, guys, you're not going to believe this, but this is what I used to do before yeah. flipping houses and here's how to do it, blah, blah, blah. And what's funny is, I mean, it, it popped off for me um, with a small, you know, I had like 3000 YouTube subscribers, sure. you know? And, you know, I posted on TikTok and it got a million views. And I was like, whoa, that got a million views, like uh, the one minute version of yeah. how to flip a couch. I was like, that's crazy. I bet you they're going to like it, you know, if I do more of this. So I put it out on YouTube. It does really well for me at that time, gets a few thousand views, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, wow, that video went viral for me. And then I don't know at what point, but maybe like a month later, it just took off. People yeah. just started catching it. And it became this thing where they were like, dude, I saw your couch living video. I would get recognized for that over anything. I was like, this is crazy. All these people are flipping couches. I actually have a real estate fund now. If you haven't checked yeah, that out, you might yeah. want to check that out. Yeah, I, I, I can help you in much better ways. <laughs> but um, if that's what you want to do, tight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that must be, that must be incredible, man. Uh, anyway, go. Uh, the, my, my question is, you now go into content creation. Yeah. You mentioned you bought uh, Graham Stephan's course. Yeah. Uh, and it was on you. It wasn't on real estate. It was on YouTube. Yeah. Can you talk about what you learned from that? And like, is this the first course that you buy? I don't know if it's a high ticket course. I don't know how much it is, but is this the first course no, you no. buy? Everything Graham does is low ticket. Okay. We're buddies now. Yeah. Um, but no, so I, I had been investing in education for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd been in business masterminds, paid 30 grand plus. And so, you know, it was natural for me to say, okay, if I want to get into content, what do I do? So, you know, long story short, how it happened was I was already crushing it in real estate. So mm -hmm. I was flipping 100 plus houses a year. And we're locked up during the pandemic. I literally have 50 house flips going on here in Vegas. And I'm like, man, are these all about to go under? Like, mm. you know, everybody's talking about who knows, right? So I start getting some DMs on Instagram. At the time, I had like 10,000 Instagram followers. That was it. I didn't have a TikTok. I didn't have a YouTube. I didn't have any of this stuff. And they were like, Ryan, you should make YouTube videos, dude. You'd be really good. And I was like, why would I make YouTube videos? That's stupid. Like, why? And they're like, dude, YouTubers make a lot of money. Like, you could really crush it. And I go, send me who these YouTubers are that are so good. So people send me Graham. They send me Meet Kevin, these guys who are now my friends. And I start watching their stuff. And I'm like, okay, so these are the real estate guys. Like, how much real estate do they do? And I mean, no offense to them, but they weren't really doing anything. Yes. And, but they were really good at content. And I was like, wait, these are the guys that you guys look up. They don't even run a business. Like they just, they have a couple of properties. I had this exact same conversation with a real estate agent about you, not 24 hours ago. Oh, really? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I do all this and this. And I was like, no, no, no that's, you don't understand. The content is what's most important. Yeah. But it's really hard. Like if you're, uh, uh, this is a really weird analogy. I do these weird debates. I'll yeah. debate people all the time. One of the debates I keep getting sucked into is flat earth debates. I debate flat earthers <laughs> cause they, like, it's, it's, because I have a background in physics. I'll have a debate with them. I'd love to know what they think. Yeah. But that's a totally different thing. So, so I'll have them on and, and, and I'll have a physicist on with me. And the physicist, I will tell you right now, if you have a physicist with three PhDs versus a flat earther, the physicist will lose every debate <laughs> because the physicist is, understands the science and the flat earther is a debater. Yeah. And the debater, but so it doesn't make any sense because you're like, how can you lose a debate where you're objectively correct? And you'll watch it happen and the guy just gets buried. Every, I've seen a hundred of these. That's why whenever I debate flat earthers, they yell and I yell, uh, yell even louder because that's, the, that's the only way of winning. And so you'll watch it and you come to the realization is like the substance doesn't really mean as much as your ability to articulate the idea. Yeah. And so that's why, and, and, and you'll get in the same thing with guys who sell cars, guys who flip houses, guys who are in any of this content creation stuff. They'll be like, yeah, but this guy, he just makes YouTube videos. And I'm like, no, no, that is the thing now. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't understand. So I, I tell my clients all the time, social media is fake and I'm okay with that because the money's real. So in your, <laughs> so in your, yeah. in your situation, go back to this whole thing. Like you're making, you, you're skeptical because you, you're in the dirt 
flipping a hundred houses yeah. so that you're doing the thing that yeah. a lot, most realtors can't do hundred flips, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and then, uh, and then we have the situation where, uh, you now start making content and you're like saying, is this guy as viable as me? Yeah. Cause he's making content, but he doesn't do as much as I do. And it makes you think either one, I don't like YouTube, which a lot of people do that. I'd be like, these people are all fake. But in your case, you're like, no, I can actually produce better content. Yeah. Well, I think what happened was I looked at them and one day they made a video talking about how much they made from YouTube. And both of them at that time, they were showing they're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. And I go, wait a minute, hold on. These guys are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a month and they have no employees, no risk, no overhead, no office. They have nothing. They have none of the things I have to deal with to go make that same amount of money. And I was like, I'm in the wrong business. Like it, it just dawned on me that I was doing the wrong thing. And I was like, these guys are actually really smart. And a lot of my buddies who are really savvy investors running big businesses, they're, they're just mainly being haters. They're like, dude, these freaking guys... Why, why does everybody listen to them? They should be listening to me, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you guys got it wrong, dude. You just need to go do it. Yes. It's a totally different skill set. So anyways, I'm like, I'm going to go learn that skill set. So I go by, I'm like, I'll just learn it directly. So I buy Graham's, I buy Kevin's. Um, I go get my friend, my now friend, Sean Cannell stuff at Think Media, you know, all these guys. And I just absorb content for like a month straight of just like, hey, what do you do to be an effective YouTuber mm -hmm. and everything else, right? So I come up with this plan and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. So I start making content and, you know, obviously the cash flipping was one thing, but the, the big takeaway that I learned was kind of like what you said was, man, dude, don't, don't hate on it. Just do it. Yes. And I think that there's two types of people now creating content. Well, there's two types of people in the world, right? There's the person doing it and there's the person talking about it. Okay. Most people would say, well, the person doing it, man, everybody should respect them and blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's true, but I mean, just think about what's been happening well before social media. Think about guys like Stephen A. Smith and whoever else that talk about it. Nobody respects Stephen A. for anything he's ever done. I used to work with Skip Bayless at Sports Radio 1310, the ticket in Dallas. Yeah. The score, he never, I don't remember him throwing any touchdowns. No, yeah. no. So like nobody, no athlete respects Skip Bayless, mm -hmm. but- you you look at the career they've built and the longevity and like they're they're crushing it. Those those two guys kill it. Yeah. And so it's like you make a lot of money talking about the thing. Now here's the thing: the most successful people do both. Yes. So you know when Tom Brady goes and signs a new deal for thirty million bucks a year plus to go be an anchor, it's like well yeah he's earned it. He d he did both. And so that's how I looked at it with YouTube and business. I was like well if if you actually do both you're going to kill it. And I actually think that's what's happening now. It took years for it to happen, but all the guys you had just mentioned that are big on YouTube, the, the, the Hormozies and Patrick and you know, these other guys, it's like, they're the ones now getting all the traffic mm. because all of these people who had no options, they were only watching YouTube only people before yeah. are now saying, well, these entrepreneurs are just as good, if not better at creating content and it's actually like from experience. So let me go watch their stuff instead of this stuff we used to watch. Um, so a great example is like Cody Sanchez, right? Yep. Co Cody will make a video. So you'll, you'll think about all these people who are moguls in business. And Cody Sanchez makes this video about two things that I'm never going to be involved with, but I think it's a brilliant <laughs> video. It's buying a, like buying a coin operated laundry mat next to an apartment complex that doesn't have its own laundry, right? And I'm like, she talks about buying these simple businesses. And you realize, you mentioned this before too, it's like when you're talking about the basic stuff over and over again, so just think about the intermediate or advanced uh, real estate agent or business owner or whatever, they go and look at your YouTube channel, you're talking about basic stuff, and in their mind they're like, well he's just talking about basic stuff because that's yeah, all he knows, yeah. not recognizing, no, this is how you grow the, the, the thing. And then I listen to Cody and she says the most simple stuff. Then I read hundred million dollar leads. I read hundred million dollar offer. And I'm like, how much of this stuff is groundbreaking? There's a few things in there that are groundbreaking, but most of it is like, he's taking all this great information and collated it into one place. And then the other thing that Alex does, that's so genius is he says, this is how I made the money. He doesn't say this is the greatest way to market in the world period. And no one can argue with me. He goes, this is how I made a hundred million dollars, which gives him even more credibility in that space. 
And so that's what I love about this, this whole situation is like everyone thinks in order to be on YouTube, you need a PhD level understanding and a PhD level explanation of whatever you're doing. But instead, it's like if you can teach the simple, you can teach the white belt over and over again. That's the best way to get leads and make money. Yeah, I remember when I was coming up in real estate, there was a lot of these real estate gurus, you know, running ads and doing coaching and stuff. And we would always hate on them because mm -hmm. we're like, dude, this is like talking about simple crap. You know, he's not even doing that much. And you realize like, well, he's he's making over $10 million a year doing it this way. So, yeah. you know, who's the dummy? And he's helping more people too. Yeah. So at the end of the day, yeah, uh, you, you have to go broad. There's only so much high level content you can put out. And, you know, if 99.9% .9 of people can't even utilize it, what's the point of even putting it out? It's just kind of like to show how smart you are. Yeah. It doesn't really help anyone. Uh, I have a, one uh, accountant who's one of my clients, and he started hosting these Zoom calls. And in the Zoom calls, he would explain all these like accounting tricks that he would do. And eventually what happens is he gets so, he, he shows so much expertise in the field that people are like, well, screw this. I'm just going to hire you to be my accountant. Yeah. Right. And I've seen real estate agents do the same thing. It's like they have such a high level knowledge. You're like, oh, well, just screw this. I'm just going to hire you to be my real estate agent. I yeah. imagine it's simpler, uh, simple because you're starting a fund. Yep. Right. And, and I, from my standpoint, I'm like, man. Man, I'm working 80 hours a week and real estate. I got to flip these houses. hundred. Well, as soon as you said I flipped a hundred houses, I'm thinking like visiting 100 different properties in Clark County when it's 107 degrees. <laughs> that was my first thought, 107 degrees. And I got to shake a hundred, hundred people's hands and then wash my hands afterwards. And like, I have to deal with all these problems. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, Oh, but he has a real estate fund. Yeah. What if I just invest in this fund? Mm -hmm. How simple it? Can you, can you talk about that whole, that whole idea? Yeah. So, you know, what happened was, I started flipping houses and that was how I made my money. And then I get into content and, you know, I start teaching people how to flip houses and wholesale and all that stuff. And one of my friends goes, dude, you should just be starting a fund. I mean, that's the logical next step once you have an audience. And I said, all right. I mean, I don't really know how. Can you teach me? He goes, yeah. I mean, he already had thousands of units. So he teaches me how to start a fund and we do our first deal together. And, you know, we raise all the capital and, you know, now we're at... What are we at? We're over 500 units, and we're actually right now buying uh, 132 units in mm -hmm. Iowa. And so, yeah, now we just raise money through social media. We keep buying more real estate. And yeah, to, for a guy like you who's already making great money in your craft, like, why learn real estate? Yeah. Why look for deals? Why go shake the 100 hands? We'll yeah. just do it. We already have the team. If you are trying to grow your real estate investing business, then you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. You have no idea what Wealthy Investor is. It is our coaching program and community. We have helped thousands of students worldwide grow their business. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're trying to get that first deal. We can help you do that. If you're trying to scale your business and go from a few deals a year to a few deals a month or even seven figures a year, we can help you do that too. In fact, last year alone, we had over 30 students do over a million dollars in revenue. And I'd love for you to be the next one. So it's pretty simple. If you're trying to grow your business and wholesale more homes or flip more homes or buy more rental properties, then you need to go to wealthyinvestor.com and book a free call with our team. It's super simple. We'll go on a strategy call with you and figure out how we can help you grow according to your needs. So all you got to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com, book the free call with the team, and we'll see you there. So can you talk about that real quick? Um, the idea of the fund and, uh, you know, you REITs or in K, like, uh, what's his name? Grant Cardone, Cardone, yep. Cardone Capital. By the way, if you ever want to know what's at the end of the funnel, that's what it is. If yeah. you're with Grant Cardone, he's going to take you to the funnel and at the very end is like invest in the real estate fund. Yep. Uh, in those type of situations, it's an, it's an idea where you get to, it, to participate in the markup or the gains as far as real estate without actually going f literally flipping. The, I think about the, my cousin one time taking the sledgehammer to the wall, yeah. knocking out the physically knocking out the wall, physically flipping the house, sweating her ass off. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, I don't want to do that. That yeah. sounds, that sounds crazy. Um, I guess my question for you is when you have a hundred flips going on, are you physically going to all those lo locations? You mentioned at one point it was very tiring for you to go meet all these people. Cause that's what I think about when I think about real estate, realtors, that type of situation is you're just, dr you're constantly driving to new locations <laughs> and looking at, is that what it's like? Um, I mean, if you're a solopreneur, sure. Yeah. Um, for me, no, I mean, I don't go to our flips at all. I have okay. no idea. I don't even know what we buy anymore. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Yeah, starting out, I was every hat. You know, I'm the realtor, the project manager, the the acquisitions guy, everything, right? And then eventually you hire your first guy. My first guy I hired was a project manager. So he did all the stuff I didn't want to do. And I focused on getting deals because that's where the money was at. Well, eventually, you know, you start delegating that out and that out. And then you just focus on being kind of like at the top and running the business. And so, yeah, I mean, once uh, my fourth year was when we got to 100 plus a year. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was done ever going in the field and, and doing any of that stuff. Wow. Okay. So when you say that, and then it's funny, have you read uh, Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell? Yep. He, was, he spoke at my event too. Beautiful. Dan, Dan's book is life changing. My, my whole team is required reading now for yeah. us. Uh, I'm, I'm hiring a personal assistant now. Yep. At first I'm like, oh, why do I need a personal assistant? And then I start writing down, I do what Dan's exercise, and I start writing down all these things that are taking my hours. And just for those of you who don't know, he said, basically he says, take your yearly salary, divide it by 8,000, and that's what you should be paying a personal assistant per hour mm. in order to take, to give you your hour back, mm. right? Real great stuff that he goes over in this book. Um, in this situation, you start talking about the same thing. You're hiring people, you're building systems to replace you in these different arenas. Yeah. What is that like? How, how are you able to build these systems and train these people? Well, you know, the first thing I did was I hired a business coach because mm -hmm. I never, quote unquote, had a job. You know, my, my only real job was playing professional baseball. Mm -hmm. So I didn't grow up in corporate America or move my way in the ranks or I had no idea what an organizational chart was. When somebody said SOP, I didn't know what it was. Like, I just didn't know. I was just literally, I hustled my way to 100 deals in a year with no structure. It was just like, yo, you do this, I'm gonna do this. Like, intuitively, I understood delegation. Yeah. And like, people doing what's optimal for their skill set. You meetings with people and like, hey, how are your KPIs? And no, what no, that, that wasn't a thing. What's your EOD? What are we doing end of day? Like, I didn't yeah. understand that. Yeah, yeah we I'm didn't right have any of you. that. So anyways, um, 2019, the market shifted a little bit. And so that was the first time I ever lost money on flips. And I was like, okay, I, I, I got to figure out how to prevent this from happening. And so, yeah, end, or beginning of 2020 was the first year um, I hired a business coach. And so great friend to this day, his name's Gary. And... You know, I paid him like 20 grand to come to my office for three days to teach, like give me the quick rundown of how to do things. And so from that point forward, it all clicked. I was like, I get it now. That's how this business should be run. And mm. we can run every business like that going forward. And so now everything's pretty plug and play. It's just like, I don't know. It's kind of just templated of how to build a business and, and launch it. The plug and play component is what we want. I guess my question is the, del so for instance, the note, the, I was like, what is the most time consuming thing I do? You know what it was for me? It was doing the timestamps on my own YouTube videos. Oh, because, geez. Because, but here's the, here's the reason why. Because the timestamp, and I would put asterisks next to the ones like, this is gonna be a great clip. I knew which ones were gonna be viral. So I was like, this was my responsibility to do the timestamps because then I can see which one's viral. So now I send it to the video team yeah. and I have 10 clips. I don't make the clips, but they do. Get, so I, I had three guys do my timestamps at the same time and I just started hiring the one that was the best. Yep. And that took a little time and it was very hard to give that away. Because mm. I felt like literally since 66% of our revenue was coming from organic and my organic traffic was coming from the reels and the reels were being done by the team based on the clips that I was giving them. Right. I was like, I'm giving this thing away to a guy that I'm paying not nearly that much. And it was very hard to give that away. Yeah. How do you train that guy and how do you get over that feeling of giving that away? Yeah, this is a big problem with entrepreneurs, right? So I'll tell you a framework I have. It's called make, manage, multiply. So for anybody who's trying to make money, the first thing you got to do is stage one, which is make. And for me, I say, figure out how to make 250 grand a year in anything. I don't care what you do. Wholesale, flip couches, freaking make content. I don't care. But figure out how to make 250. And anyone can make 250 by themselves. You don't need a big team. Okay. Stage two is manage. Now you got to figure out how to use that skill that you've just developed. Let's just say flipping houses today and build a team around that skill. Now you have to teach that skill to others and have certain people do different aspects of the skill and that's how you're gonna scale. And so for me, you haven't conquered the managed stage until you've made over a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, in the managed stage, it's the same for everyone. It's a totally new skill set. It has nothing to do with flipping houses anymore. The managed stage is all about processes, org charts, personality tests, interviewing, hiring, firing, KPIs, accountability, all these things that allow you to do what we're talking about. From there, once you've conquered the managed stage, you then go into multiply. And for me, multiply is when you've earned the right to now either invest your money, 
you can go throw, give it to me at Panetta Capital. Mm-hmm. Um, you could start a new business because so many people are like wanting to start five businesses when they haven't even made two fifty, mm-hmm. right? Or double down on your current and say, mm. hey, this business is a million bucks. How do we get it to four or five or 10, right? So it, you have to go through this progression before you ever get to do anything different because we all have like shiny object syndrome. And we're like, bro, Ryan's podcasting. I need to podcast now. It's like, well, you still need to learn how to flip a house first. Like yeah. you don't even do that good. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hormozzi says more, better, new. And I had, we had a, I had a talk with my team about this idea. It's like, so we're doing something right now and we were talking about doing a low ticket offer and then I was going to make a course, just a, a business course, based yeah. on like basically replicating what we did to grow our business from 40K a month to 500,000 a month. And I was like, um, I was like, well, we got to turn up the ad spend until it breaks. Like, yeah. We need to grow the sales team and turn up the ad spend until this current uh, offer we have breaks. Yeah. When I do double ad spend and I'm only getting 20% more ROI, then let's make a new course. But in, but right now we're getting like 26 to one ROI on ads. I'm like, we need to run ads until they break. How much are you spending on ads right now? Uh, not enough. It's the Facebook ad manager like kind of limits how much we were doing. We just had the limits taken off this month. So uh, we're going to probably spend some more, but uh, like maybe, oh, it's not even... 20,000 a month, dude. It's yeah, not it's that nothing. much. Yeah. yeah. So how, how big is your sales team? Uh, eight, uh, four closers, four setters. Okay. Uh, one lead setter, one lead closer, and then four closers, four setters. That's where we're right now. Yeah. And we've had 600 people apply to be closers for us. And it's hard because we need a very specific type. And we also, it helps a lot if they've gone through my program before they become a closer. So a lot of the fans of the program end up trying to do it. But uh, that's an issue is like the, the pace at which we hire. What's how, how much is the program? Uh, there, it's a, it's high ticket. So it's more than 5k. Okay. Got yeah. it. All right. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's three tiers. The highest one is 20k. We have okay. one that's higher than that. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's been the issue for us scaling. It's, it's funny. Cause I was talking with a, a huge influencer recently. I was look, going through his program and he had all these things written down as far as scaling. And then there was this like little thing where it goes phone sales team. And I was like, no bro, that's not the little thing. <laughs> that's the thing. That is the, that is the, the clog in your artery that ends up causing you to have a heart attack. That thing right there is the main thing. And he was like talking about like renting sales teams from other people. And I'm like, well, that'll work. But it's like, a bandaid. But it's a bandaid. But the problem is, like, after a while, like, you're talking to a guy from India who says his name is Timothy, and like, you, you're after a while, you're like, that's <laughs> not your name's not Timothy. Yeah. And this is my sales team now. You know. Uh, so it's it's really interesting, like going through these growing pains and like growing very quickly, and then talking to serious business. Here's another thing, right? I know I'm an executive of my company, but I also know that there are people more qualified to be executives at my company than me, mm-hmm. but not more qualified to make my content. I'm more qualified to do that yeah. and not more qualified to do my coaching. I'm more qualified to do that, but there's somebody else should be the CEO. Somebody else with multiple master's degrees should be doing some of these other things. Yeah. And that's another thing you have to get out of your own way to come to the realization of. Yeah. How long have you been in digital marketing? Uh, I've been making content like this for 14, 15 years. Okay. I started a business two years ago doing this. Okay, so two years you've been yeah. coaching. Uh-huh. And you didn't bring on anyone with past like um, education experience? Yeah, no, like, we have two guys. So, so it's really funny. The way I started my business is very, very odd. We, the three of us were working with a different guy and he just ripped the three of us off. <laughs> okay. And we, so we kind of started from this common place and it was weird because we had these great ideas and the guy who we were working for just kept stepping on. It's really mm. funny. He was stealing our clients to do one-on-ones for himself. Mm. He was stealing our high ticket clients to do them for himself. So he's stealing from the, from the business and then he was stealing our, um, he was stealing our commissions. It was crazy what was going on. Yeah. As soon as we cut ties with him, we were like three rabid dogs and we tore every, like we were so happy to be free and just working. And the, the other thing that happened is we were close to like three other companies and we watched their screw ups and we just, we built a company on the idea that no one ever gets paid late. Everyone, no one ever touches commit, like very simple, like Lee Iacocca when he took over uh, Chrysler, very simple rules that are very basic to make us different from everyone else. And when we did that, our expl- the growth was explosive because mm. all we did was offer value. Uh, and I think that was the part that was really great. But then we get to a scalable point where we need help from like Cole Gordon and people like that to help us get mm-hmm. to that next, yep. uh, that next, that next point. Yeah. No, Cole's texting me this morning actually yeah. about some different things. But uh, y- you know what I've realized is it's funny because I'm very new. I mean, I hate to say it this way, but I'm I'm actually still pretty new to business, even though it, mm-hmm. it feels like sure. I've been doing it in a while. You know, I. I was just playing baseball my whole life. Yeah. (laughs) Like I had no desire to do any of this. You know, I retired in 2017 and I didn't officially go full time in a business till 2018. Yeah. And I didn't get into digital marketing until 
you know, 2020. I didn't run my first ad until last year. And so yeah. like with that being said, you know, I, what I've realized now getting to talk to literally almost everyone behind the scenes in this internet marketing space, Yeah, it was funny because I, I golfed with one guy and he was like, yeah, dude, you know, in the IM space and this, and I'm like, what is the IM space? <laughs> I would have like, said the same he, thing. Yeah. He's like internet marketing, like what you are. And I was like, first off, I'm a real estate investor. Okay. Yeah. I'm not an internet marketer. Yeah. And he's like, no, you're an internet marketer. And I was like, okay, whatever. So long story short, as we've been building everything out, it's funny because now that I am an internet marketer and I know all the other internet marketers who are doing it at the highest levels, I realize it's like a very small space and they've all been doing it for like 10 plus years. Yeah. Like every single one of them has been doing it a really long time. And for those who maybe have had a lot of success in the last few years, um, most of them hired like a CEO or yeah. published under a different company that, you know, has been doing it for 10 plus years. So I was actually meeting with our team this morning and I was like, I think we might be the only team in the world that literally has no experience in what the heck we're doing yeah. and doing what we're doing, you know, because, you know, we became eight figures in just two years and we still don't know how to run ads properly. Um, <laughs> we built a, a sales team from just like trial and error. We, um, figured out landing pages and VSLs, just trial and error. We now throw thousand plus person events every quarter trial and like nobody's helping us, Yeah, you know, like, and nobody throws a thousand person event every quarter yes. the way we do. So it's like, I look at it like our, our progression of how quickly we've picked it up and I'm like, okay, I like our trajectory and where we're headed, but it made me realize that it shouldn't have really happened. Like this space is really hard to break into sure. with that experience for all the things you just mentioned about the closers and the phone team and the setters. Like nobody told us any of that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting. We stole every idea. Like there's not a, so if I had an idea about the ad spend, I was like, well, what did Tyler, what did Ty Lopez do? How many reels should we post today? How, how many does Brad do? Uh, whenever I I'm like get in there and some of my content, I get really like, by the way, Brad knows nothing about internet marketing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that, he knows that, nothing. I've tried to tell him multiple times just like how to use his DMs properly. Yeah. He still don't get it. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> he sends me conspiracy theory DMs all the time. Yeah. Um, no, but like the thing is, we, whenever I saw somebody do something well, I would just like uh, direct a camera. I was like, man, I like that Cody Sanchez video. Yeah. One of the things about internet marketing is because they're doing it on the internet, you can actually copy it yeah. easier. Yeah. Right. If somebody has something like, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you're probably tired of the same five viral songs that everyone uses in their clips. Yeah. It's the same beats over and over again. Right. Yeah, yeah. And people use them. Um, and, and, but I just watch other people who are successful. And then, so it was like for networking, I was like, well, let me do what Dan Fleischman does. Right. Mm -hmm. So when it was like, um, and then also for creating content and going viral, I actually, uh, it was Bulzarian. I was sitting in his living room one time and he goes, you know, for TikTok, what we figured out was it, something has to happen in the first three seconds, yeah. like period. And it's hard because my, my team, a lot of time ha has too much context. They know what I'm saying and they forget that the audience sometimes doesn't. And so I'll go into a, 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 it'll be a reel and the beginning of a reel be like, this is my opinion on this. And I'm like, let's cut that out. Yep. I don't want to say the first three seconds needs to be an explosion, a weird word, a super con first three seconds. People have very short attention spans. And so we just, every idea we got, Alex Becker stole a bunch of, I have a welcome video in my, um, my program that basically talks to you like you're a three-year-old kid mm -hmm. and I stole it totally from Alex Becker. Alex Becker does one. He's like, you're going to want to skip around the course, but I need you to stop doing that and <laughs> do what I tell you. Don't skip around the course. It'd be a little dumb, dumb. That's how he talks. And I was like, yo bro, I'm doing that. Like that's exactly what I'm stealing everything <laughs> he's doing. Uh, my clips channel, I stole from Rolo Tomasi, uh, like all the stuff, uh, like uh, it was somebody else we took it from. And like you said, we had no idea what we were doing, yeah. but, but the thing is there's so, this is what I love is that there's so much information out there that's free free. Um, and then w also buying courses is really great. I was going to ask you about this, the idea of like getting a college education versus just buying courses from people. It's way cheaper. Way and cheaper. these people are so much more successful. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a way better way of doing it. But yeah, just, just going back to what you said, man, it was just, we, we were able to reverse engineer everything. Mm -hmm. And then you know what the crazy part is when I knew we were doing well, I mean, not just because the money we we're making, we started getting guys on sales calls. And I, so I do a, a meeting with my sales team every week. 
and we're getting guys on the sales calls. They're like, yeah, this guy was funnel hacking us. <laughs> I was like, after like the 50th guys, like they're calling us and they're asking me how much money we're making, how many ads we're running, how big the sales team is. And I was like, oh, they're just funnel hacking us. Like that's all they're doing. And I was like, well, that's kind of a uh, compliment. Yeah. The fact that we're, you know, we, we've been doing this for 18 months and we're already getting funnel hacked. Yeah. You know? So I, I imagine it's the same thing with you, but like, you no, know, the two guys that I did it with, one of them does have a master's degree in financial mathematics, but we really didn't have experience in this. Yeah. We just became obsessed with doing things this way. If you look at my course, it's built like 67 steps from, from Ty Lopez. Lopez. It's yeah. built that way. So, I mean, that's kind of where, you know, you get the ability to do that. So your, your growth, that's amazing. You know, doing eight figures in two years yeah. is fantastic getting into the space, but also let you know how much room there is in this space, right? Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure. It's funny because we had lunch with a guy, um, his name's Zach, and so, you know, his company's done 50 million plus every year in uh, education. And him and I were talking about it. He's like, yeah, you know, same thing. Like, I study all the people. He's like, I've been watching you for a while, and I can't figure out your angle on what you're doing. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, like, your VSL doesn't follow anything that you would normally do in a VSL. Like, you just literally tell them straight to the point of, like, everything. And I was like, yeah. I was like, that's what I would want. He's like, yeah. if it works, it works. He's like, I just, he's like, I've never seen it before. Isn't that crazy? It might be a new thing to try. I did a seven minute VSL that was awesome. Ty, if you do, you remember the, this is here, me and my garage. Mm -hmm. So we, we funnel hack everyone. Ty sends you to a 90 minute yeah. VSL that you can't fast forward through. And when you get to the end, of course you're gonna buy. It's only $67. Yeah. And you just spent 90 minutes listening to this guy talk. Yeah. So it is one of these things where it's like, do I get to the point because I respect the client's time yeah. and just get to the point, there's no reason to hide it, or do I make him give me a pound of flesh by listening to 90 minutes, in which case now he's more invested. Yeah. And I think both strategies could work. Well, I'll give you a funny story. So in 2018, when I went full-time into business um, after baseball, First thing I did was I went to the 10X conference here in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had never bought anything in the business space. And so um, I didn't even know who Ty Lopez or Russell Brunson or any of these guys were. I'm like, who the freak? Like, who are these? They're not pro athletes. Like, they're nobodies. And everybody's like, Ty, Russell. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, these treat these guys like they're freaking kings. They're mm -hmm. just internet guys. Anyways. Um, Russell, that, that, that was like his famous speech where he sold 3 million bucks. I was one of the people that was the first thing I ever bought. I was like, I don't even know what I'm buying, but this, that was like so good. I got to know how he convinced a skeptic like yeah. me to buy it. So I bought it and then Ty was like next. And at that point I was in buying mode. So I just bought Ty's. I don't even, once again, I don't even remember what I bought. By the way, Ty buys everyone's course. If you guys don't know this, Ty has a person who buys, Ty's probably spent 150 grand a year on just different people's courses. That's funny. Yeah. He told me this the other day. I was like, yeah, I have a guy who just buys all everyone's courses and we just learn what they're doing. That's funny. Yeah. So, you know, I buy both of their things and it was that I was like, okay, I could get to education. So, you know, fast forward 2018, I write my first book. And I just make a course. I don't know what the frick to do with it. Like, I didn't understand the marketing side. So I was like, I don't know. They told me that you could just like make a webinar and run ads and it'll just like print money. And so I, I gave a guy like the stuff and he spent like a couple thousand bucks. And I was like, this doesn't work. So I quit. I shelved it for years. And then um, 2020, I started making organic content and that leads to, you know, all these sales and stuff. I'm like, all right, I should probably take this education thing a little more serious. And so we do that. And then um, it's funny because everybody's like, bro, you have to run ads. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, dude. Like, I'll just make organic content. And they're like, no, dude, at least retarget. Like, just, just retarget, please. Everybody was telling me. And I was like, fine. So, you know, I hired these guys in, I don't know, 2021. And they're supposed to, you know, every agency will tell you they've worked with all the big guys, right? Bro, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, you, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Logan Forsyth. Yeah. I just hired him. Oh, nice. Because he, he told me he knew you and, and Brandon Carter and, exactly. and Ty Lopez and, uh, and Gregor Gallagher. So I hit all those guys up and I'm like, what do you guys think about him? He's like, oh yeah, he's great. Yeah. yeah. So everybody will tell you, you know, whatever. They've worked with everyone. And so, you know, I tried these guys and after like three months, we just, we're like, this is stupid. Dude. We're, we're done running ads. Like, yeah. it doesn't work. Whatever, right? So in 2022, we finally like, I mean, we didn't even crack the code, but we finally were like, wow, we're actually like getting a return on ads. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, now, um, you know, we'll do six figures a month on ads. Yeah. We, uh, we figured, uh, there was a hypothesis I had turned out to be correct. 
we show in my ads, I say very little and show a ton because I have so much, I, I teach a networking course. So it's me with people and it's me with really beautiful women at these events. Okay. And the women, we're never touching each other. There's nothing lascivious. They're not like, I don't, it's not like bikini shots or anything like that. But it was like, we would just show the thing I said and in every single thing that we did and then made very few promises. And that seemed to work fantastically for us. And I think part of the reason why is, and I'm sure you've seen this before, is the overpromising by certain people in their ads. You know, like you can't sell a crypto course, I think, on Facebook anymore. Mm. In fact, I don't think you can actually even say a dating course. I don't even think you're allowed to do that on Facebook anymore mm. because there's so much overpromising in those fields. So what we did was we uh, uh, we say in my, my podcast is like um, more evidence, fewer words. So yeah. we showed as much as we could. And then said very little, and that worked fantastically for us. Mm. That's what we did. And we A B tested that, and that worked because I had so much footage of me hosting these events. Yeah. So it worked out really well. But like going back to what you said before, we didn't want to run ads either. We were like, we're just going to build this whole thing over organic content. And yeah. I was like, man. And I told my sales team, I was like, guys, this isn't going to work. Or not my sales team, my two partners. I was like, this isn't going to work. Like, we're going to get to a point where like, I, if this whole business is built off Michael Sartain's Instagram, this is not a business. Like, <laughs> yeah. At some point, we're going to have to, yeah. we're going to have to expand. And you do get to this point where like, if you can figure ads out, is that like, he goes through the whole thing in his book, and I just finished his most recent book. He goes through the organic, right? And then he goes to paid. And when he goes to paid, he was like, this is the hardest thing to figure out, but if you figure it out, holy crap, man, you can make so much money. And then the last thing he goes through is affiliate. Yeah. He goes through uh, the, the, the people who get people to buy your product. He goes, like, this is how you expand exponentially. Is by, this is how you get to $100 million. And so like, you just learn so much from watching these people. And like, let me say this again. These books and the stuff you talk about and the stuff Cody Sanchez talks about and especially the stuff Ty Lopez talks about, it's not groundbreaking, but he puts it all in one place and he makes it simple for you if you're a starter and makes you feel comfortable and you watch him for a while, you watch you for a while and then I trust you, right? I want your autograph. Oh, take a picture with me. Like when you see, see you in public and then at that point, you're just more likely to buy from this person. Then you buy, this is the other thing I also figured out. It took a while for me to figure out. If I have a high ticket offer and I sell it, you know what? I'm not competing with other people. Most people who buy a high ticket offer, you know what else they do? They buy other high ticket offers. Most people who buy coaching buy other coaching. And most, a lot of the successful people I know buy coaching or they buy some kind of education. So I didn't feel like I was competing with these other people. Like the number of people that I know that buy like either Wes Watson's course or Sean Whalen's course or whatever and then do my course also is crazy high. And so that was another thing I, I kind of came to the realization is like the, I need to collab with these people because there's a group of people that are only interested in investing in themselves and that's where you want to be. Yeah. Right. And they'll buy courses on stuff they don't even um, what's his name? Um, Adam Lyons bought a course on real estate. Didn't even know it was a real estate course. <laughs> Goes through the entire course and ends up like building a court, a dating coaching course. And then in his course, he uses his company to now buy real estate because of the course he accidentally bought. That's funny. Yeah, yeah that that's kind of funny. stuff. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's it, it's a crazy world, man. The digital marketing world's crazy. We, um, I, I'm just like watching it as an observer and knowing all these guys, and I'm just trying to project where I think the ball is moving because mm. I think. I don't know if I got lucky or I was just really good at that in 2020. I was like, I got to go all in on TikTok and YouTube. The mm. time is now. And like, I just hit it hard and it paid off. Um, and now I'm just kind of looking at the landscape and I'm like, where, where is, I guess the blue ocean. Yeah. And to me anyways, for us, I think the blue ocean is in events. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. We're do, we do, we do six a year. Yeah, oh, I'm we, trying to do over 30 next year. There, yeah, that's a, and I know I know um, uh, Dan does a ton. I go to a lot of Dan Fleischman's events. Yeah, and so yeah, that's that's a big deal. Yeah, for us, uh, the Blue Ocean was that no one in dating was teaching networking and leadership, and no one in leadership was teaching dating. So we just made a course that was just like, don't pretend to be a man. Other people want to hang out with actually become that man. So that that's where where we found our Blue Ocean. Um, one of the things I always want to ask you about because especially because. I talk to Brad Lee and Adam Sosnick and, and Wes pretty frequently. Um, you, you have no profanity in the stuff that you're doing, which doesn't probably doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but mm -hmm. to the rest of us, that's a decision you make. And when you watch like Mr. Beast or like other people who go incredibly viral, they either bleep out their profanity or they just don't have any at all. Was this ever a decision for you or was this just how you were all the time? Yeah, no, I mean, as a Christian, I just don't cuss. Yeah. You know, it has nothing to do with content. Yeah. You know, so... Um, Look, I mean, with content too, you're going to attract your tribe. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be guys who resonate with you who don't resonate with me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And like, that's all good. Like the, the worst thing you can do is try and be something you're not. Yes. And it's so funny because whenever I get these guys who speak under our events, like a Brad, um, they, they know I don't cuss, but I don't tell them. I'm like, bro, do whatever you want. Like, I don't, I'm not like putting, uh, the child protection on you. Like just, just do what you do. And, um, sometimes a lot of times they'll like catch themselves cussing and then they'll apologize. And it's so funny to me because I'm like, dude, I didn't tell you, you couldn't cuss. Like just, <laughs> just do what you want. Like, it's do you so feel true? Do you feel guilty that like I'm watching you? Like, <laughs> yeah. am I the judge? That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, the other idea was, um, let's go back to this. Uh, I have a friend of mine. He paid 150000 to PBD, Patrick Bad David, just to like coach him through a couple of stuff and turn his business around. Yep. I know another friend of mine who paid a bunch of money to Tony Robbins. I will tell you, before I got in this space, I was super skeptical. Now, when you buy someone's course and you get a, like a really positive ROI and you skip these early steps, especially when you compare it to the price of actual traditional education, Man, oh, like the idea of like sell, like buying an Amazon FBA course or buying a course on like like Closer Academy or RCA from Cole Gordon or something like that. How much the ROI on that compared to getting a degree in philosophy <laughs> and how much money you have to spend? Yeah, Can you talk about this is for you. Have you gotten to the point where you like buying courses and how do you judge which courses that you buy for your um, own education? You know, for me at this point, we we still buy courses and all that stuff. Um, I would say like my own personal development, I spend a lot of time, money, and resources on just networking and relationships, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you know, all the people you've been mentioning, um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to have them speak at my events and I haven't had to pay them anything, mm. you know? And like, we get all these people on the podcast and, you know, I just try to create like something of value that people would want to freely come to. So it's like, Hey, I know if I speak at Ryan's event, it's going to be worthwhile for me. Right. And so they come, if I come on Ryan's podcast, I'll come to Vegas and I'll do it because it's worthwhile mm. for me. So if I can create things of value, I'm just going to attract those people anyway. Right. And then at that point, once I bring the right people in and I build a relationship, I go direct to them. Like I'm not watching their course, you know? So it's like, it's really interesting because that's bailed me out so many times, mm. you know, being able to just text Dan Martell or Neil directly. I literally, I mean, this was, um, I'll just show you right now. So like today, who was I texting? I was texting Neil earlier today at 12 yeah. about something. Then I was texting Hormozy about something. Yeah. And then I was texting Cole. He's right there. And then I was texting Jared from Cardone's. Mm. So like, that's what my day is like. Yes. Like I go through problems in business and I'm like, dude, how did you do this? Yeah. And then like, that's it. That's how I learned. I literally text Cole Gordon yesterday about how do we set up compensation packages for additional coaches? Like mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, it's really interesting. So Cole and like, I'll stay at Cole, Cole's house. Cole and I have a relationship and then my sales team has a relationship with his instructors and those are two different relationships yeah like uh, like i mentioned before bilzerian might be doing a course in the in the future me and dan have a, a relationship and then dan's team and my team have a relationship yeah. so it's like what you said before right and i do think that that is important that i can just call some of these guys up uh, a lot of times like whenever i there's a controversial thing and i don't know how to answer like what i'm going to say i'll listen to patrick bet david i'll be like before he goes on I'm like what is pb because pbd is like He's not all right. He's like politically conservative. He's not far out there. And I find myself agreeing with a lot of stuff he's saying. So I'm like, okay, what would PBD say in this situation? Uh, and so I, that, that's a, another thing that's like actually been really helpful. Exactly what you're saying. It's like being able to network with those people. Um, very controversial individual in Romania that I was going to go fly out there and interview. And I, the first thing I did was ask uh, Dan Fleischman. I was like, dude, can I do this? Because you and I know some people who are very politically progressive. And if I go out there, they're going to be pissed at me. And, and he's like, you have to do it. Like you have to do this. And I was like, and that, that kind of changed my opinion on a lot of stuff. So you're right. So absolutely. you ended up going out to Romania and you filmed with them? No, he got arrested in the, oh. <laughs> jail for several months, but I still do text him every once in a while. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say like, even for, uh, you know, PVD and all these guys, I mean, like they're at such a different level. Um, you know, we, I was with Ed Milet mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago at his house filming and just to get to, I didn't have a relationship with him before. Yeah. And now we do. And it's like, now we've been talking about just different things and opportunities, but like the one thing that 
I think for me, I guess, that offers a lot of these guys value. So uh, actually, let me take a step back. So one thing like Fresh and Fit and those guys yeah. talk about that I think is really interesting is like, hey, being a, a man of value, mm-hmm. like how do you offer value in, for them, the context of women, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you can be good looking, you can be fit, you can have a good career and whatever else, right? I think about that as like me as an entrepreneur to these guys, what would make them want to have a relationship with me? Mm -hmm. You know? And so I thought about it a lot and like, how do you become a great connector? And it's like, okay, well, what are the different ways you can provide value to people? And it's like, okay, one is attention. And so, okay, the podcast, the events, I can offer attention. That's a big one. Another one is skill. I can offer them skill and knowledge and maybe something they don't have skill and knowledge on. Luckily for me, most of these guys don't know anything about real estate, yeah. but they want to learn. And so what happens is Neil calls me up. He sells a $20 million home. He's like, hey, I got, what, what do I do in this situation? That literally happened. Cole Gordon has invested in my fund. You know, like these guys ask me about that. So I'm like, okay, what kind of skill can I offer them in value? Um, you know, the third thing is just simply being a good connector overall. So it's like, hey, you want to meet this person? let me connect you with them and, you know, just be a value. And so that's kind of like where I'm at today is how do I just make myself so valuable that like everyone wants to be my friend? Yes. Right. Uh, I love that you said that. I literally posted uh 9 a.m. this morning, my team posted one and I was like, uh, it was a clip and it basically was saying you're, especially as a man, you're not a special snowflake. Like you're, uh, I had uh, Justin Waller come on here. And he goes, he goes, I don't really want to be friends with people I can't make money with. And he wasn't trying to say that to be shallow, but he was saying that like, I only have so much time in my day to be friends with people. And like these people who are the ones that I have the most in common with. Now I'm not to that level. I have tons of friends I don't make money with. Yeah. yeah. But the idea that, um, you know, the idea that like we have these people in our lives that like you can, um, you can becoming valuable to other people is like the best way of networking. Because one of the other things is like, you believe, oh, I'm a special snowflake and all these people are going to like me just because of my internal energy or my chakra or, uh, you know, whatever the the new thing is. And my my whole thing is I don't want people to like me for that. I want people to understand that I can be valuable to them. And then the other thing I learned was from, from Fleischman is I do as much as I can for other people and ask for nothing in return. Right. That's another thing. I absolutely, I try to create so much goodwill with as many people as possible. And the doors that have opened for me have been exponential just from that one concept. It's very hard. And you know, you know, this is another idea. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I feel like that mentality weeds out cluster B personality disorders. What is a cluster B personality? Uh, so, so sociopath, so antisocial personality disorder, histrionic, narcissistic, and uh, and borderline. Got it. I think the idea of me doing things for other people and asking for nothing in return weeds out cluster B personality disorders. Mm. Um, specifically, the sociopath types, the, like those highly. The I think those type of individuals eventually get to a point where they're like. I'm not getting anything out of this from this relationship, so I don't want to do this anymore. So I, that's why I like it, especially the philanthropic stuff that we do. So I love Cole Hatter. I met Cole Hatter in two seconds. You're like, this is a great dude. Yeah. You know immediately when you talk to this guy, he's great. You meet Cole Gordon, you meet like immediately, this guy's a great, great dude. Yeah. When you listen to Wes Watson, you're like, he, this guy loves his client. He loves them. Yeah. And so that that's one of the issues why I, I really like this lifestyle. Yeah. Is because I'm dealing with people who the meritocracy or the free market has rewarded them with success and, and uh, monetary gains and in addition, they do same things where they have to literally care or else the, the market is going to weed them out. Because there's mm-hmm. too many people offering value for you to be the one who isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, the bar keeps getting raised. And that's what I was saying with YouTube and everything else. It's like before you had all these guys who weren't doing business as the guys on YouTube. And now they're getting kind of shadowed by both business and YouTubers yeah. and good content and good edits. And like that, these guys are storytellers and you know, the bar just keeps getting right. Mr. Beast keeps raising the bar in his own self, you know, every video. And so when the bar is constantly being raised, you know, the cream's going to rise to the top. And, you know, it just becomes that thing where, man, you know, like for you to compete in anything, uh, just take baseball, for example. I remember 15 years ago when I was um, coming up, man, yeah, 15 years ago, I'd have been a freshman in college, right? Yeah. It was like, dude, if somebody's throwing mid nineties, that's a big deal. Yeah. This dude's throwing gas. The amount of guys that throw a hundred plus in the game today is unreal. Yeah. 
I'm just like, holy crap, dude. Like, you got this guy, Shohei Otani, who's freaking leading the league in homers, striking everybody. This is nuts. Yeah. So, yeah, the talent level is just going to keep increasing. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting when you see that. Um, there's a couple things I want to ask you about. You you mentioned something with Fresh and Fit that I thought was really interesting, and that was the idea of the ten year time horizon for buying properties. This is something I'm going to get into. I, my uh, my company we're probably going to start buying properties, and then my, myself personally. And um, one of the things that you were talking about was the idea. So I, I come from the finance space. I used to work for a. a I, I still do work for one fund, but I was a option seller. That's what I mainly did. I was a quantitative analyst for a fund. And so I would deal with a lot of market makers. So BlackRock is a is a market maker. They they'll take the both sides of every deal to the point where they make money on the bid ask spread. But they also buy single family homes, which I wasn't aware of until I listened to you discuss this idea. And the idea was like basically they were buying this almost like an arbitrage opportunity if they bought enough single family homes. And you said that they weren't doing any negotiation. They were buying at one hundred percent value. They were just buying as many as they could, and they would hold on to them, and then they would get a return in the future. Can you go into that that whole? First off, the idea that hedge funds are buying these single family homes. Yep. And number two, the idea of like not trying to flip, but holding things for a 10 year time horizon. Yeah. So I got in the game in 2010 uh, when I was a realtor. I was 21 years old. And I remember at that time, you know, people would talk about the auctions. Like the auctions are great deals. These flippers were buying these houses literally in Vegas for 20 grand, right? These guys are buying houses for 20 grand, either holding them or flipping them for. 100 like so they were killing it then all of a sudden around 2011 or so um hedge funds start coming into town yeah. and you know blackstone was the big one and all of a sudden they're bidding up all these properties to market value just wiping out all the flippers who um you know were were making all this money during that time and people were like dude these guys are crazy they're overpaying they'll never make money on this and it was true if you were only looking at it from a flip perspective, yep. yeah, they were never going to make money. They were going to lose money if they wanted to flip it, right? Well, they had a different time horizon. They're like, we know 10 years from now, five, even five years from now, these are so undervalued, it does not matter what we pay for them. Yeah, we, They're worth 100, we'll pay 120. It does not matter yeah. because these are so undervalued. Yeah, and when you're dealing with something like BlackRock, we're dealing like almost a trillion dollar valuation, like AUM, and you have to put that money to work somewhere. Yeah. It becomes hard. Like for instance, if you, there, there's a point at which you can no longer buy stock in a certain mid mid cap company anymore and get any ROI because you're raising the price of it so much. Like not for you and me, mm -hmm. but like you and I, or all, all the people we know are not going to change the price of Microsoft. No. But there's a point at which when you're dealing with uh, almost a trillion dollars, uh, you cannot get liquidity or a good deal. This is something I deal with. Tom Sosnoff, who, who sold several brokerages, he's a billionaire, he's a friend of mine. And he would talk about this as like, there's a point at which the vehicle that you're trying to invest in cannot handle the level of money you're trying to put in into it. And so when you deal with this situation, when you talk about the Sequoia, BlackRock, or any of these other hedge funds, when they get into it, the, the real estate market is so massive, right? It's it's up there with like fixed equities, fixed income, which is the the bond market is the biggest. I don't know if people know this. Bond market is like four times the size of of of, um, of the stock market. And uh, when you get to that point, this is something where I now I can put a ton of money in there. Now it may it may increase the price of homes in a certain area, but yeah. it's a place where I can send a ton of liquidity to. Yeah, yeah. One, well, it was a place that was a blue ocean. Yeah, like single family homes were not an asset class; they were for mom and pops and just sure. primary residences. And so, you know, the housing shortage we have today, even with high interest rates, are really due to investors and funds and everyone noticing that like this is a great asset class on its own. And unfortunately for, you know, people trying to buy a house, we just haven't developed the technology to build houses fast enough or cheap enough. Mm. And so 3D printing, it's coming. I believe you. Yeah. And I've seen it and I've looked into it. And it's like, until that becomes a thing, there, there's always going to be a shortage. And so sure. for all these people thinking like, oh, you know, market's going to crash and this and that, I'm like, no, it's not. I mean, uh, it's funny because I interviewed Patrick Bed David um, a year ago, I think in June of 22 or July, mm -hmm. right around there, right? And Pat's like, dude, everything's good. Like, it's going to drop 50%. Yeah. And I was like, Pat, it's not. He's like, it is. There's not like, enough supply. I go, Pat, it, you don't get it. Like, you're you're a beast of an insurance guy, but you're wrong. And I was like, there's not enough supply. And guess what? When they raise rates, these people are going to hold on to their homes. There's no way they sell. 
because why would you sell? You have a three percent rate. You're yeah. not going to sell that. And sure enough, it's exactly what. Yeah, we we went through like a little mini dip. Yeah, and then this this year's, you know, uh, positive growth year over year. And yeah. There's still no supply. Prices are still high. Rates are still high, and it's showing no signs of slowing down. And so it's like, you know, these funds and everyone know that because it's like, well, what else are you going to buy? You got money to deploy. Mm. It may not be the greatest investment ever, but what are your alternatives? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, you know, we talk about. I had a discussion with people about a manufacturing economy and how a lot of the smaller little widgets that were produced in this country before now they moved over to China, electronic components and, and stuff like that. But when you build a house, other co- we can't outsource this to India. The, ho- the homes must be built by people who live in the United States for the most part. Uh, and have the highest standard of living of almost any industrialized country in the world. And so that's going to get harder and harder as you have to pay a union electrician or a union carpenter to do these jobs. And there's only so many of them. And so that, like you said before, it's going to limit the amount of supply. Yeah. You know, and I've read a lot about deflation and, you know, Bitcoin and all these things and technology being a deflationary um, thing. And I, I believe it, you know, it's like, man, chat GPT and these AI tools are not going to like, make things more expensive they're actually going to make it cheaper yeah you know it's like Agreed. if i needed a copywriter to go do all these things now all of a sudden that one copywriter can produce 10 times the amount of copy that they could have before it's like yeah they might get a small bump in pay but the output is going to be significantly different um can you talk about the the it's funny the the a couple things here the real simple quick and dirty on this idea of wholesaling because I think a lot of people like this idea because you said you watch TV ads where people were like flip these houses with no money mm-hmm. right how does that work because it sounds like just seems like an arbitrage opportunity that you already set up previously is that pretty much what we're talking about here yeah so I mean wholesaling the gist of it is well, we'll just use the three people in this room so yeah. you got a house you come to me and you're like Ryan you know I want to sell it to you I know it's worth 400 but I'll give it to you for 320, right? Because I need to sell it like yesterday. So I put it under contract with you for 320. Then I know my guy back here, um, he's a house flipper and he's willing to pay me 340 for it, right? And so what happens is I'm going to assign my rights to the contract to him Mm -hmm. for the difference between what I have it under contract for and what he's willing to pay. So in this case, 20 grand. Yeah. So now what happens is he goes and funds the entire deal for 340. You get your 320. I get my 20 grand, he gets the house, he then takes it, goes and flips it or keeps it or whatever he wants to do. And you don't have to fix it up, you don't have to fund sure. it, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You just gotta push paper. Okay, so now the arbitrage part of it, I understand. The part I don't understand is how does the retail customer or the retail client, how is he able to find these opportunities on a regular basis? Because I mean, everyone, I would love to find you know arbitrage opportunities to flip anything, but how, how does he do that? So when you say the re- so in our world when we think about the retail buyer we're thinking about the end buyer Sorry. for the property. Uh, what I mean when I say retail I'm thinking about it the from normal the normal guy f- from the hedge f- from the from the finance standpoint it, there is the the institutional investor and then there's the retail investor. So yeah. you know, what I'm saying is uh from a, from the guy the normal guy who's like going yeah. through Craigslist ads or whatever yeah. how does he how does he able to find these arbitrage opportunities? Yeah, so how does somebody become a wholesaler? Yeah. Um I mean dude there's lots of ways, right? I mean the three main ways are MLS, which is what's already on the market. Okay. Referrals. This would be realtors or buying from other wholesalers or direct to seller marketing, right? And so at my company, we do all three. You know, I got my start just strictly not spending any money on um, marketing. I would just network, you know, going back to networking. Yeah. I would network, meet other wholesalers, buy deals, you know, meet realtors, all that stuff. And then the MLS, all those properties are on there. So it's just a volume game of how many offers can you make, right? So I, I probably bought my first 70 homes with those two. Didn't spend a dollar on marketing. But I knew in order to do 100 plus a year, I needed to start marketing. And so we started going direct to seller marketing, doing cold calls and text and direct mail and PPC. Now we have TV commercials. And so you know we got heavy into that side. And so there's lots of ways to find deals. Um, I mean, there's, there's way more in depth I could go into about yeah. targeting people and negotiating and you know, all that stuff. So you, you would actually have a team, like say setters, whatever, that are doing outbound to yep. try to find, and then you're running, ad, you're running TV ads. Yeah. What, what is a, like I'm saying, maybe a YouTube ad. What is it? What are you saying in the YouTube ad? Are you looking to? I'll give you a funny story. Yeah. So I've literally spent 
you know, over a million bucks on our TV commercial mm -hmm. over the years. And I mean, it's produced millions, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> it's literally the same commercial I've had since 2020. Mm. It's never been updated and we run it on freaking Jerry Springer and whatever, <laughs> dude. So are you in it? Yeah. Oh, that's so, so great. Yeah, dude. So it's a 30 second ad and it literally is just, it starts off with a good hook and I'm like, I'm Ryan Pineda and I want to buy your house. Yeah. That's the hook. Right. And then I'm like, we'll give you a cash offer, no fees, you know, all this stuff. Right. And it's just like, call the number, go to homerunoffer.com. And like, literally it, it's been playing for four years straight. That's I've crazy. never changed it because the, the KPI say it still works. Yeah. That's exactly until it breaks. Yeah. It has not broke, but, to, but it has broke in that every time we've tried to scale it to a certain number, it yeah. breaks. Okay. So like the ad itself is fine. It's just the problem that came with scale each time was either that channel could no longer produce that ROI because it was just hitting the same people. And so, you know, the cost per lead would go up or our sales team just wasn't big enough. They're just getting to... You know, that they're only going after the low hanging fruit because there's so many leads coming in. Darn sales team, bro. It's yeah. it's rough, man. It's hard. Like one of the issues that we're coming we're going to be coming up on in the future is that I have a low ticket offer coming out. So now does my setter push the the does he push the lead to the closer? How much is it? Uh, the low ticket? We haven't we haven't fixed it. Okay. It's not gonna be more than two hundred bucks. Maybe 50, oh, okay. maybe fifty bucks. Low ticket offer. Well that should never be a salesperson. No, no, a setter. No, 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 no. What, what I mean by it shouldn't get to the okay. There's no, what should happen is if the guy goes through the affiliate or if the guy fig, finds out about the uh, low ticket offer, they just go to the low ticket offer. They never talk to a human. Yeah, exactly. Right? Very much like, very much with like, um, uh, what's it called? The Hustle University that Andrew Tate did. Same, same, same type of idea. If they do get on the call with a setter, the setter now has a choice. Do I send this guy to a closer because he's financially qualified? Or if he isn't, do I now push him to low ticket? And my problem, it, the only issue is like, if he gets a commission from the low ticket, is he just going to take the easy way out? You see what I'm saying? And there's like this balance. Again, we haven't even gotten to this point yet, but it's something that I'm already thinking Do your thinking setters about. not get paid for high ticket close? They do. Yeah, they do get paid for high ticket close. My, po well, my point is the high ticket close is so much more expensive than the low ticket. Yeah. And then their, their likelihood of getting paid. Whereas like, I'm, I'm thinking when we do low ticket offer, we give 100% commissions. Again, I'm just spitballing this. I have to still go, we have to discuss <laughs> It seems like, great, we're in. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, you're saying it's 200 bucks, right? Or yeah. whatever, right? Uh -huh. Under 500, I mean, yeah, a closer shouldn't really No, no, talk close. so it's the way I, But yeah. I'm saying a setter shouldn't even talk to him. They shouldn't talk to him. The setter is talking to a person who set up with a setter. The setter is somebody who went through the funnel and they clicked uh, to set up a demo and they talked to the setter. Yeah. My point is the, now the setter goes through it and it's a guy who just happens to live in Paraguay and has no possible way. Who's like a fan of my content and like wants somebody to talk to. This happens all the time with my setters to just have their time wasted by guys who are not financially qualified. And, and then he's like, he's got this issue is like, do I just send this guy to the low ticket or do I, you know, what do I do here? My yeah. point is at what point do we get to a, there's a place where I listen to my, I don't know if you've ever done this because I've never worked in sales before, but I've had my sales guys come live with me before and do sales calls <laughs> in my house, okay? Because okay? I want to know. And often I'll jump on the call to, to get the close. And I listen to them and there's a point at the calls where I absolutely would have given up, Ryan. I would have, I was like, bro, this, I, you sound hopeless. I can't help you, sorry. And my guys push and they win so often. And these become some of my best clients. And I'm like, man, if this, if my sales guy had not pushed right here, you wouldn't be in this program changing your life, changing your business and have, finding the woman of your dreams. That wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And I, so, but I'm not good at that, right? And so I'll, I'll listen to them. And, I, and so there's places where I would have quit. And if I was a setter, I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna send this guy a little ticket offer. He's not gonna, he, he can't afford it. And, and I just wanna make sure I don't get, put my, my guys in a conundrum. Does that make sense? Yeah, what I would suggest is, kind of like what we're about to roll out. So to this point, our cheapest coaching program has been 10K. Okay. And so we're about to roll out a 3K. And, you know, it, it's going to actually do something I want it to do, which is the opposite of what you just said, where there's a lot of people who can't afford 10K, mm -hmm. obviously, right? And so they go on payment plans and, and all these different things. Yeah. It would be better for both of us that they end up just buying the 3K. Okay. 
I would rather them do that than get on a payment plan. Yes, I feel the same way. There's so many guys that I'll, I'll listen to their stories and I'm like, man, I want to help this guy so bad. Yeah. And then they're just like floating in the wind and I have nothing to give them. So I, I put them in, it's like, watch the podcast. Here's my free call. Like as soon as I get out of here at four o'clock, I'm doing a free call with like several hundred guys go live on YouTube. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you something. <laughs> There's some lunatics that will try to jump on your call if you ever do that. Uh, and I, and I, I'm so excited to do this because I want to do this for the guys who kind of like, they, they live in Mumbai, they live in, they live yeah. in Managua right. and they love the content and they deserve to get help too. And it's not their fault. They were born in a third world country yeah. and I want to help these guys so badly, but I can't, there's no way they can afford my course. And I went, and so like, and these leads just float out there forever. And I'm just like, I listen to the sales calls and when the guy doesn't buy it, I'm like, man, I want to help this guy. Yeah. And I just think like, is there a, a, a vehicle to do it? And like you said, you have a 3k course and that might be the way to do it. Yeah. And that, I mean, obviously for those guys, that's still way too high, yeah. but for us, um, it's going to solve a lot of our problems yeah. because to, to your point, when we have that offer, we don't need a closer to close it. So a setter would be able so to 3k close. really. Yeah. So so Wes, I think his is thirteen hundred for with no closer. So yeah. we thought the the number was right around there because I've had a dis I just had this discussion. Yeah. At what point do you not need a closer? And you so you think it's three K? The stats say it's three K. Wow. Okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. Now, well, Grant and Miguel are going to have a discussion about this. Yeah. Um, and the stats say three K from everyone who's done it way longer than me. Okay. That's the point of which people need to talk to somebody and, but. You know, our vision is, I mean, I'll tell you, like, we're going to launch this in two weeks. I don't know when it's going to air, but we're going to launch this in two weeks. It's going to be 3K. You can do a two pay for a little bit more. Um, and our expectation is people will buy right then and there yeah. on their own, you know, during this challenge that we end up doing to promote it. Um, from there, what I anticipate happening is running an evergreen webinar. Yeah. And we expect that it should still convert even at a 3K, because we'll still have the two pay option, right? Haven't been done, but based on other people still doing it in the space, it works. Mm. From there, yeah, normal leads that come in, I mean, they're gonna be with a setter regardless, right? So people are gonna come in and the setter's gonna qualify, hey, does this person qualify, whatever, yeah. right? If they don't qualify for 10K or above, they're gonna have the option to close them on the 3K. Uh, do you have for your closers? Do you give a higher commission for paid in full? Yes. Do you uh, for your setters? Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to ask. Do you overtly financially qualify them? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Okay. So we've we've experimented with both, and we found that things go. Be there, there's this thing, especially in where where I come from, because a lot of my clients come from like failed dating courses. Yeah. I have a huge, huge component. And so there's a little bit of skepticism. So when I overtly financially qualify, they're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I know I apologize again. Uh, the, the, <laughs> Everyone apologizes yeah. to me for no reason. So 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 that that's the issue. So we've we've sort of we've changed that up a little bit. Well, let me add there's to some context, right? Because for our, our stuff with real estate, it's assumed you need money. Mm. Right? Like everyone knows real estate costs money. Yeah. And so like one of our qualifying questions is how much do you have to invest? We straight yeah. up ask you. And that's a qualifying question for a number of reasons. But it, I think it makes more sense. It uh, totally makes sense in your industry. And that's why I'm saying, yeah. like, for our industry, it's assumed. Yeah. Dude, bro, I mean, yeah, we can wholesale and do stuff, but yeah. real estate's a costly industry. Yeah. This isn't dating, you know? Yeah. So it's very different. Yeah. And I actually specifically talk about in my course to do it with no money. Like, not that the course costs money, but like I teach you how to do everything I do without spending money. I'll tell you a story too, just speaking about content and um, niches. So my audience, I mean, they've spent a lot of money with me over the years, tens of millions. They've invested tens of millions. Like, it's been a lot of money in just a short amount of time. And the type of content I put out is very, I don't want to say it's high level, but it's just very, um, it doesn't attract cheap people. I'll tell you what it is. It's not lowbrow. It's not the clickbaity yeah. type of content that is super lascivious or like a, one of the problems in my industry is there's too many people in my industry who want to see women get shamed. And I'm so totally against that but that goes viral so you're pulled into yeah. that direction and you don't have that issue because you're helping people build value and make money yeah so it let's just say it, it attracts higher quality people right yeah and so you know we that just is the audience we attract tormozzi's the same way mm -hmm. right um 
we did this with Graham. Um, man, was it last year? Yeah, last year. We started a fund with Graham because I'm like, dude, I mean, you got so many subscribers and like, let's see yeah. how it goes. You know, the problem is he attracts cheap people, right? Because everything is about saving. Everything's about the news. Oh, got and, it. Yeah. And, and everything's about the, the market's crashing. And so everybody's very scared and fearful in yeah. his audience. And so what we found was, as we tried to raise for this deal, he actually could not raise as much as me, even though he has, let's say, 10 times the, the subscribers, yes. right? And it was just this interesting thing that we realized where, man, the type of people you attract really matters yeah. in what you sell. And so like, we have an agency now, and the first thing we teach our clients is like, look, guys, first off, what's your business? Okay, Because this is going to dictate what kind of content you put out and who you're trying to attract. Is the goal to get the most views and followers or is the goal to get the right people who are going to spend money with you? Like what's, what's your overall goal for this? And so for me, you'll never see me talk about the news. You'll never see me talk about, I, I, for one, I just don't want to. I don't mm. even know what's going on. Mm. I couldn't even tell you. And two, it's like, yeah, it, it would be nice to have more followers and there's, way, there's ways I could do it by just being more broad and like attracting those people, but I don't want them. Yeah. And I don't want to make the content. Yeah. And you can, it's crazy when you see how much money some people make with much smaller followings because it's very niche and they're only going out. It's like the golf channel, right? The golf channel doesn't do as much as NFL network, but the goal, I promise you the people who watch the golf, Dude. if I'm an advertiser, I'm going right for the golf channel. Like look this, at, look at how much they pay the golf or PGA for sponsorships. Yeah. I mean, it's because they know that audience is extremely valuable. And I was actually, it's funny. I was, um, we've never really tried to get sponsors for WealthCon. So mm -hmm. like our, uh, we run WealthCon every quarter and I've never focused on sponsors because I am my own sponsor. My booths of all my companies are everywhere. Yeah. Right. So it's fine. But I was actually talking to Fleischman about this and I was like, man, you know what though? It is a missed opportunity because there's things I don't offer that people attending really need. And like b if businesses could understand the value of that room, they would realize how good of a deal it is yeah. to be a sponsor. And so I just started to reverse engineer it. And I was like, all right, let me do a webinar explaining to businesses what they're missing out on by not being at this event as a sponsor. And let me get some feedback on what they've been paying at other events, right? So, you know, I, I've spoken at a lot of events. I've been to a lot of events. I go, guys, okay, tell me about, you know, the events that you've sponsored. How much did you pay? How many attendees? All that stuff, right? A typical booth sponsor might be five to 10 grand at mm -hmm. like an event, right? Just for like the bare minimum. Yeah. And I go, okay, so how many people were at the event? Well, a typical event might be 300, if you're, it's three to 500 if it's good, right? And most events at that level are charging 100 to 500 a ticket, right? And I've even talked to Dan about this because, you know, his new events company, that's their model. It's all very low, like their average ticket price is about 200 bucks. Now, they're going to go crazy and get two to 3,000 people at the event. Yeah. But still, when you, like, if you're going to really understand what the total value of the audience is, you can actually reverse engineer it and you're like, okay, what's the value of the room? Well, if there's 500 people in there and they paid $200 a ticket, the value of that room is 100 grand, right? So, okay, that, that's a 100 grand room. WealthCon, we have 1,000 people. Mm. And our average ticket is $1,000. So do the math. I mean, I think it's, what is that? That's a million? Uh, a thousand, thousand times a thousand is a million. A million. Yeah, yep. a thousand is a million. So right there, the room is 10 times as valuable just based on ticket price and audience you know, attendance, right? So you're like, well, theoretically, you should pay 10 times the booth sponsor. Like this is how advertisers advertise on YouTube. That's yeah. why CPM exists. Because my CPM is $50. Other CPMs are 10. Why is that? Because the quality of the audience is so much higher. Yeah. Now, I don't get as many views as some guys, but I'll still make more on a video because of CPM, right? So long story short, I'm like, guys, okay, number one, just based on ticket value, the room is 10 times more valuable. Would yeah. you agree, right? Number two, that's not even counting how much these people have bought from me. These people have spent tens of millions of dollars already with me. Like I know they will spend because I've been the recipient. And we have receipts. Yeah. So this is an audience ready to buy if you have the right product. And I'm telling you, you have a product that they'd be interested in. And so I'm like, okay, so think about this. 
you, you're used to paying 10 grand to some scrub event with low ticket, low quality people, right? If I go and give you a booth for 15 grand, you're stealing it. And so, you know, it's just helping people understand the quality of the sure. audience. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, I do these videos, uh, let's, let's go, you know, the, um, uh, the whole thing Hormozzi wears to open up his nose, better sleep, some people yeah, yeah. wear that mouth tape to keep from uh, sleep apnea. That is a boring, that is a boring topic that could absolutely change someone's life. Oh, for sure. Sleep apnea, could, it's, you get 50% disability in the US military if you have sleep apnea because it kills people. Mm. Boring. If I have a guy come on my podcast and argue that the earth is flat, hundreds of, just blows up super viral. But the problem is this, why would advertisers, like you talking about real estate, if I'm an advertiser, even if you have one tenth as many uh, views, I know your audience is more valuable than the guy who's talking about ancient aliens that live under Antarctica. Thousand percent. And so that I think is where the difference is as far as the AdSense. Because I'm, I look at my view count and my AdSense compared to some of my friends who get way more followers, and I'm like, how do I get more views? And I think it's because I talk about evolutionary psychology. I think that's part of the reason why. So yeah, I definitely agree with you as far as that's concerned. The, yeah, the quality of the audience. The quality matters a lot, and so for anybody thinking about content and everything else, you got to keep that in mind for who you're really trying to. Now, look, if you're Mr. Beast. Right, and he's going after everyone. And let's just assume I mean, the more people you get, the lower quality it is. There's only so many high quality people in the sure. world, right? Well, then you just have to create a low quality product, yeah, right? So it's like Mr. Beast created candy bars, perfect thing I mean, for his, these guys. This, he has a disproportionately high number of his audience under the age of 18, so yeah, he kind of has to do he sells to that audience. Same thing with Logan Paul, he's got an energy drink, like that's where yeah. he perfect can't, product yeah. for what he's built. He's not doing a bond arbitrage product, you know what I'm saying? No, that's no. not where for the, for the dab, dab, dab uh, crowd, yeah, exactly. Uh, can we talk, go over this idea? Uh, this is something uh, I think that get kind of gets lost in the sauce when you have people who want to get into entrepreneurship, but they don't know how to humble themselves. And that is the idea of finding mentors that'll help you in different ways. So if I was going to get into real estate, you mentioned before about finding a mentor in real estate, mm -hmm. right? Finding a mentor. You, you, you said you brought, bought Graham Stephan's court. By the way, have you ever done a taco Tuesday with Graham? Yeah. Yeah. So I do that with, uh, uh, Spencer Cornelius, one of my good friends. Yep, and so yep. we do that every week. It's all, I think it's one of the greatest things about the city is that all the YouTube content creators, we I all know. come together and have dinner on Tuesdays. I feel bad because Lucky invites me every Tuesday and I just, I haven't been there in years. Dude, I knew Lucky when Lucky was, Lucky Lopez, when he was just flipping cars, didn't have a YouTube mm -hmm. channel. I bought a car, I think I bought a car from him at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky. That's crazy to see how Lucky's just totally blown up yeah. in this car. It's another great space to yeah. be in, right? Um, but finding mentors in these different areas. Can you talk about that and maybe the struggle that some people have where they try to do every, like what you said before about, you said you were trying to do uh, uh, ads and you hired someone. We were, we were hard-headed about that. We wanted to do everything ourselves. Mm. Can you talk about finding a mentor, hiring a mentor, uh, and that kind of stuff? Um, for one, I don't try to do anything on my own anymore. Yeah. It's just dumb. Uh, number one, like time is the only limited resource on the earth. Money's easy to come and get, right? So... For me, it's like, I want to get on YouTube. I'll, I'll tell you, I actually tried to pay somebody a lot more money than the courses. The problem was I just could not find anybody that fit what I was looking for. So I, I was ready to shell out the money, but I got stuck with courses and I had to figure it out on my own. Um, two, as far as anything goes, at this point in my life, any skill I want to learn, I'm either going to hire somebody to teach us it or hire somebody to just do it for us, right? So... I mean, right now we have a new ads guy and he's absolutely crushing it. Um, you know, he'd been doing it for a while for other guys, but I'll tell you, it's not a cheap deal, right? Like we're paying him a percentage of profit plus a fat retainer. You know, we're paying him 20 grand a month as a retainer. And, you know, it's like, man, dude, that's, that's a lot of money. We built something to this point that is really good. But I know for us to get to the next level, we are going to have to get somebody even better and better. And, you know, I'm, I'm super hopeful for that. It just crushes and we all make a lot of money together. But you know, the, the whole point is in order to get to the next level, like you need to get somebody who's actually going to do it with you. Um, and you know, whether they do it for you in this case, like, and then eventually maybe hands it off to my team so that we can do it and we, we go crush it for however long that is cool. But yeah, that's one example. Sales team. You know, Cole, Cole and I met because we hired him. He's yeah. like, dude, you know, our sales team's not good enough. How do we get this guy, right? Get Cole. And, you know, he does this thing and teaches us 
a ton of stuff. And the same is true with my business coach and, you know, all my real estate mentors. I had them all on my podcast and then hired them. That's how it worked. Yeah. Half, half of my team now, we had them on. Uh, Char Modell, who does my uh, social media stuff, we, she was sitting right there and did a, did a podcast with her. Graham was sitting right here. Uh, Nick Cosman helped us with the copyright. Like all the stuff, we just add them on the podcast. My, when I went to my, my other, the other execs and I was like, who do you guys love? And they would tell me and I would have them on the show and then I would ask them all the questions that they wanted and then we'd hire them. That's generally how it would work. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So we use the podcast as almost like a recruiting tool. Oh, for a thousand percent. Yeah. Dude, a thousand percent. I mean, like, just the amount of people I've been able to pick their brains on on the podcast and then develop a relationship and learn and, you know, even if it's not in a um, formal payment setting. Sure. It's been crazy. And the other thing is it never ends. Like there's no, the, the, you made you made this statement and I love this one. Um, first of all, I want to tell the story. The Have you heard the Bradley Grant Cardone story? So Bradley had invested in one of, Brant, uh, one of Grant's upcoming ventures, whatever it was. He doesn't describe it. And he, he's on Facebook and he sees Grant Cardone every five seconds on his Facebook. And he calls Grant, he goes, bro, I'm gonna have to unfollow you. Uh, like, this is crazy. Like, you're, you're, you're too available. I'm seeing your face too much uh, and I may have to unfollow you. And uh, Grant said something, he uses a little profanity. He goes, you don't even bother having one mother. <laughs> he says that to him and he just hangs the phone up on him. Yeah. And I was like, that's it. And like, no matter what you think of Grant, who's a, who is a controversial figure, Grant is in the billionaire club yeah. because he was talking about things that were controversial and didn't cash is king. You remember the whole thing yeah. or like cash is trash. Yep. He says cash is trash and the market falls. It's like, how's the cash is trash looking for you now? Or no, the market goes up or something. I forgot what it was, but it's like he could even be provably wrong and still make money. Yeah. You, your statement was people who don't have content will never survive. Building a business is a must. Building a brand is a must. Mm -hmm. And so whereas before building a brand wasn't that big of a deal, and then it became an optional deal. You think in the future it's it's not optional anymore? No, you're going to have to make content for marketing mm -hmm. one way or the other. I mean, and it doesn't have to be you as a personal brand, but your business is going to have to make content. There's just no other way around it. It'd be like saying, oh, well, my business just doesn't need to, you know, do cold calls or freaking PPC. Like, it's just marketing. That's mm -hmm. how we have to start thinking about brand and content. The only difference is a brand demands a premium on everything that you cannot explain. A brand can sell you air and you will buy it, mm. right? And I was telling my team this the other day because it's just, just kind of funny, but it is what it is, right? Um, you know, you think about Tesla, they're a brand. They've sold tequila and random things, right? Yes. It's like people have been waiting on the Cybertruck for a freaking however many years with all, like that's a brand. You believe in whatever it is they're selling, right? Grant's the same way. You know, he's built this 10X brand. You know what it's all about. He literally sells 10X growth con without a date, a location, a speaker, or anything. He's like, it's going to come out, get your tickets, and you buy. And it's crazy, but that's the power of a brand. And we, we did it at our last event. I said, hey, guys, if you buy this thing, you're going to be eligible for our winter retreat. Yeah. There's no date, there's no location, and people buy it, right? That's because of the brand equity you've built up that they're willing to buy it and you know trust that it's going to happen, right? Um, the other thing happens too is just like with your normal things, you, you can demand a premium on the price. You don't have to spend as much on ads because you have content. Just everything about it makes it better and you get the right people into your communities, right? Because yeah. imagine if you were having a community where there was no like alignment or purpose or just random people are coming in and out and you're like, dang, why is this guy... You know, they got like these kind of guys over here and these kind of like everybody is very similar and it's only because of brand. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think a couple of things allows you to pivot. Yeah. Right. Cause if you, you've built up that level of trust, the number of guys that went from dating into doing a business course, right. Or maybe not the best examples, but the guys who went from Forex into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right. It allows you to pivot. And, and be able to sell other things. Uh, Ed Milet doing annuities, right, as another example, like where guys can switch. Um, and it, you do that because you built a brand and you built the trust. So you're right. The yeah. brand can sell ice to an igloo. Well, and think about or, like, um, yeah, to an Eskimo. Ice, ice to an Eskimo. Yep, yep. Sorry. So, I mean, think about Louis Vuitton, right? Yeah. They're the prime example of a brand. And it's like, these guys sell shirts that are $5 and they get a thousand bucks for them. It's crazy. Yeah. Imagine that your brand is that powerful that you just put an LV on it and it, 1,000 X's. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I really loved, because I was 
you know, I, me selling a course, you mentioned something that I really liked and it, it was like, so a lot of people are trying to bootleg my course. If you go on Reddit right now, well, I shouldn't even be saying this, but it's going to be <laughs> furious, but you're not going to, they, they're all ripping you off. None of it's the real course. Uh, but people, you know, I've seen a hundred different people, MOA courses for cheap, all this kind of stuff. And they're just trying to rip off the actual videos. And I was like, and I was trying to explain to some of the guys in the company, I was like, they're not going to win by doing that. And I, and I didn't put it the right way, but you did. Cause you said you're paying for community systems and feedback. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're also getting when they're paying for the course, not just the video modules. We don't even sell courses standalone. Okay. No, neither do we. Neither, but, but I'm just yeah. saying, can you can you go into that whole idea of the other things that you get along? They could if they copied all your content, they still don't get you. Yeah. Because of the feedback in the community. Yeah, you know, we had a workshop two weeks ago and I told everyone, I go, Hey, why are you guys here? Right? People, you know, had varying reasons why they were here as a real estate workshop. And you know, I go, guys, we we were just talking about the concept of why people buy things, right? And I was like, Why did you buy this workshop? I was just asking them, I'm like, you can watch all the YouTube videos and I'm going to cover everything we do in this workshop. I've covered it at some point on YouTube, right? So why, why fly out to Vegas? Why pay thousands of dollars to be here? Why'd you do it? And people are like, well, I just, I want to scale my business. And, you know, oh, th there's different reasons I'm here, right? I wanted to see the operation in person. And I'm like, you know, the real reason that you're doing it is because number one, you want to consolidate time. Because for you to go on YouTube and try and find all the things we're going to go through, it would take a ton of time. Paying to just come to two days to get it all, way easier, mm. right? So you're trying to consolidate time. The second thing you're doing is feedback, like yeah. you mentioned, right? And I, I asked them, I go, hey guys, how many of you guys have watched my podcast? Everyone raised their hand. Mm -hmm. I go, how many of you guys have maybe watched more than five? Everyone raised their hand. I'm like, so you guys have spent a lot of time with me. How many of you guys have actually done a deal? And like, not that many. Yeah. And I go, Why? The content's out there for free. Yeah. It's all out there. And they're like, I don't know. I go, well, it's because you don't have community. You don't have anyone holding you accountable. Also, too, you had no skin in the game, right? When you only watch content for free, there's no skin in the game. So you have nothing to lose by not taking action. But I was like, the fact that you guys are all here, you took time, you spent money, you're sitting here, you're taking notes, you're invested now. Okay. So now it's a different story. Community accountability the investment, time, then the feedback. Like these are all things that you're right. You can't, you can't steal the course and get that. Well, and also too, the last thing I said was there's also this element of seeing is believing. Mm. And so when you're at an office or an event or something else, it's like, dude, I'm literally talking to this guy right now. Like he's not just some guy on TV, you know? Like, yeah. He's just not like this fake character that just seems not like you're right there in person and you're talking to me. Do you, do you ever, seeing is believing. Do you ever jump on sales calls with your sales team? No. No? No, I haven't, I haven't done it in a long All time. All the time. Right now, I just, shout out to Tyler. He said, hey, bro, can you jump on a call right now? <laughs> I will get on there and I will grill their ass, bro. Yeah. Like, it, like it, there's a point in the, in the call where like the guy's making the excuses. And at first I was like, oh, this is a legitimate excuse. After you hear the excuse the same time over and over again, like, bro, this is not an excuse. And I show them hundreds of clients that have gotten over the excuse. Yeah. I'm too fat. I'm too old. I'm Indian. I'm Asian. I'm too short. I don't have money. Like it's the same ones over there. My wife left me, blah, blah, whatever the thing is. Uh, networking is for me. This is going to take too much time. I don't have the money. Like it's the same ones. Yeah, yeah. And it just dry. And I get on there and I'm like, how's your life going now? How's everything working for you right now, bro? Is this what you wanted? Is it like, and you get it to them yeah. and it feels good to do that. But I also know that there's no possible way I could do this long term. Yeah, it's not scalable. With, 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 not but being scalable. The, fu the funny thing is, um, at the events, I'll do it, yeah, right, because I'm there and like they're taking pictures and and all this stuff, right? And I always make fun of the sales team because, and I push the sales team. Like I want to create a competitive culture. Like I'm always trying to think of ways Same, to, yeah. to keep it going. But it's funny because my clothes is so different than theirs, mm. right? My clothes is just buy it, dude. And then people buy it. And they're just like, <laughs> they're like, Ryan Panetta just told me to buy it. I have to do it. Yeah, he's right here. Like I'm like you're really not going to buy it. That's my clothes and they buy it. Right. Oh and the God, sales it's team, a, it's such a, it's such a like high school, like a uh, uh, peer pressure thing. Yeah. And I'm sure I, I can just see it working. Oh, it works every time. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, you know what? You're right, Ryan. And I'll be like, what's your problem? Sales guy? Like, you know, but it's just, you know, <laughs> it just cracks me up and they're like, dude, you don't have any sales skills. Okay. Like it's yeah. just, you're you. 
Yeah. And I'm like, well, still sold them. Yeah. Still got the sale. All right. So let's talk about this. Yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, I don't get anybody in trouble now, but with all the nightclubs here closed, and I go out a lot, yeah. and all the venues closed, and we started having these mansion parties. I don't know if you're aware. Okay. There were parties everywhere. Uh, the, over in Tamayasu, I'm sure you know that whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other place was Dragon Ridge. Yeah, yeah. 750 Dragon Ridge yeah. had the sickest parties during during the pandemic that I mean anybody had ever gone to. You know, Photo my, shoots. You know my brokerage sold that. And I do know that, which is yeah. why I'm asking the question. Yeah. And it was $1 more expensive. Was 14 mil? Was that what it was? Or 11? 12. It was, it was 12. Or no, it was 11, 250. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if the, the buyer wants us to say his name, but we all know him. He's a good buddy of mine. Uh, can you talk about that whole situation? Uh, uh, like you selling that house? Yeah, so, you know, my brokerage and my partner, Nick, um, he had a relationship with the buyer yeah. and um, you know, they knew each other from club days and stuff and uh, you know, he ended up buying it. So I did not represent him just yeah. to be clear. I'm not even an agent. Yeah. So, but you know, my company did. And uh, you, you saw the house. I saw the house. Yeah. yeah it's I a filmed, beautiful house. Yeah. No, I filmed a video at it. It did good. You, uh, you ever play basketball in there? Oh yeah. We play, we, every time I go there, I just go hoop. Just shoot hoops. I just shoot hoops. There was a huge party going on. Yeah. We're having like a maxim party and I'm in there just like seeing if I can hit 10 threes in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, he got a great deal because I mean that house today is worth twenty million. So it is the closest thing to. Uh, did you ever see Bulzarian's house, the the Wish Mansion, and the the house that Bulzarian I filmed had, there too, one hundred nine seven nine Shalon Road. Uh, that is the, that's the I think the closest allegory to that house is the seven fifty Dragon Ridge. Yeah, you know what's interesting is so I'm a member at Dragon Ridge, yeah, and I bought two acres in Dragon Ridge mm -hmm. too, and um, I was going to build something better. Yeah, um, but. I'm kind of happy where I'm at now, so I've got the land for sale. Yeah. Yeah. You know the whole thing about uh, you know, the best way to do a deal was with other people's money? Yeah. My whole saying is the best way to throw a party is at someone else's house. <laughs> someone else's house. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? The, the only thing I don't like about that house is it's it's just four stories, and yeah. it's just, man, I mean, there's been so many parties there, I, I, I wouldn't trust any part of that house. What? Really? Oh, no. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, no, no, no. I'm saying like... Uh, cleanliness wise oh got it yeah mm -hmm. yeah that you don't even realize there's a fourth story like and you finally yeah. go up the staircase of the with, you know because the bowling alley is down at the bottom yeah yeah man it's so much good times at the house man so yeah good, if you guys want to hear it go to my youtube channel about uh, selling that house yeah definitely want to check like it out. there's a huge house tour on that one and the um bel-air house that bilzerian had yeah that one is crazy like uh did you ever hear the story so he he bought it with a rent it was a rent to buy agreement Okay. And then he it was a $5 million option that he had on the house to sell it above anything above 30 million. Uh -huh. I think that was it and he got an offer for 60 and then the owner this is Bulzarian's story. He said on my on my show. The owner said he wasn't willing to like so what was going to happen is Bulzarian was going to end up pocketing 30 mil. 30 mil. No, minus the option. So 25 mil. Yeah. And the owner was like, I'm not letting you keep the 25 mil. So they got into litigation and then he, or he didn't accept the offer and then immediately rented to wish mm. after Bulzarian left. And so it's this really weird situation where like, because Dan having the house made it the most popular party house in the world. 10979 Shalon Road was the most, bro, those parties were better. I've been to the Playboy Mansion several times. That was, those were the best parties anyone's ever thrown in the history of the world. <laughs> and him having that house made the value actually go up. Yeah. Which is the opposite of what you think because the, the people around that house hated the fact that they were throwing those parties. Yeah. Uh, and and it, the, the offer he got was so high that the, the guy was like, I'm not going to take my, my, your $5 million option and lose $30 million. And so that's essentially what happened. I don't know if you ever heard that story. It was crazy. I haven't heard that story, but I don't know how he would get away with that without getting sued. I think he did get sued. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know what happened. Or maybe he said that the offer wasn't in good faith, or I don't know. I don't want to put words in Dan's mouth. But what I do know is that Dan was then upset because he's like, after you did that, then you rented to other people. And it's like, then they devalued the property, the devalue the house. You know what I'm saying? So it didn't, it didn't work out the same way. I don't know. I don't know how the whole thing works. Yeah, Dan, Dan should have exercised his option. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to know the truth of, of what the deal was and... You know, it's funny about uh, Dan's house down the street here. That's where I used to live, a um, couple doors down. Oh, you did, the, like, on that, yeah. I don't say the address here, because he yeah, lives yeah. there currently. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't live far from here. That place is crazy. That's a defensible position. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. there's walls, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty great. We're playing. Um, I'm literally, like, the next block over. Okay. Yeah. We're uh, we're playing uh, Mario Kart. He's big into Mario Kart. He has, like, eight TVs up. We're all playing Mario Kart. 
and there's a door that goes down into the basement. I'm saying this for his own protection. There's a shotgun and several pistols right next to the door. <laughs> okay, somebody gets some crazy ideas. And there's a guy who who runs his house, not like a butler, but the guy who meets you at the door named Mason. And you can just see all the people this guy's killed. Like he's, it looks like a dangerous, dangerous man. That's crazy. It's really funny, Dan's house. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really cool going over there. We were having a meeting one time and you just don't even notice there's an AR-15 like sitting next to the couch, like in this little holster. Just chilling. Just chilling there. Everywhere you go, it's, it was like that, man. It's pretty well is he i mean is his normal life just like normal or is he just always got girls and parties there's all there's always girls there he doesn't like to party he's not super extroverted but there's just always girls there's always girls. he doesn't even have to try yeah there's just like always girls wanting to come over and visit him and then he'll have some events and then just like they'll they'll source them there's some awesome. <laughs> they'll, 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 it's like it's like so masha was doing this for a while my friend masha did it but like girls will apply for a casting to work at ignite and then he'll have an event and then the girls will just want to stay there for like a week Got or whatever it. right and it's like he doesn't he doesn't ever hit on this is really true he never hits on girls they just like throw themselves at him right most women are not going to throw themselves at dan but dan's life is such that the women who do want to throw themselves at him funnel their way into his life so from his experience it's nothing but women throwing themselves at him and yeah. so the other thing is when i hang out with dan so let's say it's like me dan and like four other dudes right so let's say there's six of us and let's say there's 20 girls it's not like four girls for each of us bro it's 20 girls for dan <laughs> and the rest of you guys need to just play chess or paintball and just ignore the women because they're here for him wow. that is one thing you have to if you ever hang out with dan do not think you're just gonna like slough off with some, they're there for dan that's essentially what's going on that's crazy yeah it's that's it's funny it's pretty cool yeah it's pretty cool hanging out with them um all right so the other thing i was gonna say is um the hair where does the hair come from you get comments on the, uh, <laughs> the hairstyle yeah you know i just uh dyed it black uh, well, it's supposed to be like a smoke gray a little bit. It's hard to tell, but uh, it was red earlier. But not it. I mean, I've been doing my hair like this for like six years. Yeah. And when I was getting on social media, people were always commenting on it. I was like, what the heck, dude? Like, I didn't even think it was a big deal, but people were always talking about it. And so one day, it's like, you know what, then I'm just going to really let them talk about it. So I'll just start dyeing it. Different and colors. So, you know, dyed it a bunch of colors. And I like to have fun with it. Do you ever get it straightened? No. Okay. No. My hair so, naturally yeah. goes like this. Straight. Okay. Like I don't use a blow dryer. I don't use anything. Yeah. That's interesting. It's yeah, Filipino no, hair. I had a lot of people comment on that. They're on like, the hair. Oh, he's the one with the hair. It's exactly. Like, yeah. But you know what's interesting is, uh, you know, you don't want to be generic, right? So it's like you can recognize, pe if you can identify somebody based on a characteristic, that's always a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, Hormoz, he's the guy who just wears the wife beater and Crocs. Like, the super jack guy. You know, you know how like motivating that is when he's wearing Crocs and like these torn up ass shorts on stage. Yeah. And it's the hundred, honey, it's, I'm telling my girlfriend, it's not the $50 million offer. It's the hundred million dollar offer. Yeah. You see those shorts he's got on? That's yeah. what he's doing right there. You see yeah. that? See the beard? Yeah. Like, that's it. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. And you just see these guys like uh, James Harden with yeah. the beard. You see, um, I mean, there's not many of them, honestly, that you could just point out their characteristics and you would know who they're talking about. So yeah. to have something is, um, people should really go for it. You know what? It's funny. It's totally random. I was thinking about this. Have you ever seen the video where Grant Cardone is under a bench press? No. And he's doing the bench press. And it's hilarious because he's there's five pound weights on each side. <laughs> and it... At first, I was like, does Grant not know that there are five pound weights on it? Like, I would never, I would put fake weights. I would yeah. never put five pound weights on a 45 pound bar. And then I realized, no, he's playing chess and we're playing checkers and he knows that I'm going to comment on this. Uh -huh. And I literally send it to my friend who's a bodybuilder. I'm like, do you see Grant Cardone bench pressing 50 pounds? <laughs> what is this? And I was like, no, Grant, I've been fooled. Grant yeah. obviously did this on purpose. Yeah. And it was, re it was really funny watching that, man. I yeah. just remember like these little details that you catch, yep. you know? And I'll probably do, I'll steal something like that. I'll be like, I'll get in there in the gym and I'll have like, I'll be in the 25 pound bar. I'm like, oh, uh, do you want to get strong like us? That's yeah. funny. Yeah. Or yeah, because you can't be, so I guess that's the point with it, right? You can't be just generic run of the mill, sure. right? So you're either going to be like Grant and just like making uh, making it funny. Yeah. Or you're going to go lift crazy weight and people are like, damn, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Like when you think about it, like fitness influencers now, like the, the idea of not being on steroids, when you see them, like they're all, huge and roided up and you're like what you don't even like, just think imagine being the natural you know fitness influencer yeah or if you are a natural fitness influencer and you look like that no one thinks you aren't taking steroids right so you get into that whole situation yeah you know yeah i was talking to brandon carter about that because 
he just got on TRT. Yeah. And I was like, man, dude, like all these guys are on it. He's like, but some aren't. He's like, yeah. some aren't. And they're just super jacked. Yeah, I don't think Greg O'Gallagher is on anything because he's just not a big dude. He's just like strong as shit. Yeah, right? he just takes care like, of himself. I have no guys on roids. They're bigger than Greg O'Gallagher. If Greg O'Gallagher's on steroids, then he's like really small for being on. So that's why I believe him. Yeah. You know, with all, and the other thing is, I don't even mind if dudes are on roids and doing that. That's not the issue for me. Yeah. The, 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 I guess the issue would be like, I guess maybe detrimental as far as um, other people following them. And not realizing, like the Michael Hearn thing, you know what I'm saying, or the Rock, who's clearly taking fucking <laughs> something, and he's like, he's like all natural. I don't care that you're not all natural. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Well, the problem is with like Hollywood celebs is they can't say it. Yeah. They're just probably in their contracts, and they cannot say what they did to get that role and yeah. whatever. But no, it's crazy because obviously I came from the the sports world where all that stuff's illegal. So mm-hmm. I've always been super against it. I'm like, bro, freaking like get that stuff out of my face. And so for the last 12 years, I've literally been 180 pounds and like give or take five pounds. And yeah. I've, uh, just, and I've stayed strong. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, I'm not like this huge guy, but about five weeks ago for the first time, I finally got on um, TRT and peptides. Okay. And I've literally gained eight pounds in five weeks. Isn't it crazy. And I'm like, what the heck is going I'm like, I'm not even on like, the crazy stuff yeah. that these guys are on. I'm like, no wonder like these guys are so crazy. The thing is, it's like scurvy. Scurvy is a vitamin C dis- deficiency. Most people don't have a vitamin C deficiency, but if you, di- if you, if you have one, then vitamin C is a miracle cure. And if you have low testosterone and you take TRT, TRT is not for everyone, but if you have low testosterone and you take it, it's a miracle cure. Yeah. You know, like for me, I'm 45 years old and my girlfriend's over 20 years younger than me and I can keep up with her Yeah, because I'm on TRT. Right. Um, I mean, that helps a lot. They definitely, I definitely don't, I, I'm telling you right now, I'm not be doing the show and doing 12 <laughs> hours of content a week if I'm not on this stuff. Right. Uh, or it helps significantly. But yeah, it is one of those weird situations. I was going to ask you if you would ever consider taking, you're 34, 30, Yeah, 34. 34. Yeah, I'm 40. I didn't start until I was 43 years old. Right. Started taking well, TNT. Well, I think it, it hasn't become this big public thing until the last few years. Yeah. Like, you know, once again, right, I came from the sports world, so all of it was illegal. So I was like, I'm never doing that anyway. And then like, I meet all these entrepreneurs who are on it, and I'm like, for what? Every one of them, bro. Yeah. Every and, single one of them. Yeah. So in my mind, it, it's not even like out of jealousy or envy. It, it, well, I guess, let's just say like back in sports, you know, you would get pissed at guys that were on it because you're like, yeah. dude, this freaking guy's a cheater. Like, yeah. And then in my mind, I'm like, yeah, these guys are cheating. But I'm like, wait a minute. There's no drug test. Like, there's nothing. Anyone could do anything. Yeah. Like, we're just YouTubers, right? Yeah. So I'm like, okay what, why are you taking it? Right? Like what's the purpose? And it's like, what's getting huge going to do for you? Right? Like I'm married for 10 years. I got three kids. I don't need to get huge, but I had somebody clearly explain to me the benefits of each one of these things. He's like, all right, you want more energy to be better at your job and be a better dad? And I'm like, yeah, okay. You want X, Y, Z to, to think more clear. You want this to lose more fat. And I go, okay, but what are the side effects? He's like, there are none. Like these are just like, yeah, the, the, you know, especially with the peptides. And I'm like, man, you're telling me these aren't like the steroids I grew up with, correct? Where they just destroy you, correct? They down destroy the road. your endocrine system. These are these, the reason why people don't grasp the difference between TRT and steroids. Is steroids is like your this is a, a a super physiological level of exogenous testosterone which causes your body to shut down. When you do TRT, you can also take other things like hispeptin, gonadotropin, or HCG that will cause your body to continue to produce testosterone, but it's at a lower level just because you're older. Uh, and then when you take it, what you're doing is you're getting to the levels that you were when you were 19. Yeah, that's not super physiological because when you were 19, your liver and kidneys were able to handle your 700 total test or your 800 or your 900 total test. You're just going back to that level that your body was already able to handle previously. Right. That's the reason. And people don't understand that. And they think that it's something that it's not. Yeah. Uh, in those type of situations with the peptides, one like Summerillin is a great example. It's not actual HGH, but it makes your body produce its own HGH. Yeah. Uh, thymosin is, um, you know how inside when you cut your the inside your mouth you know how it heals faster yeah right well that peptide that causes your body to heal faster they just inject it into your body that's it's your own bpc 157 thymosin is just basically it causes a lack of inflammation to cause your body to heal faster but it's using things that your body was already doing right and that's the reason i'm four for four on peptides every peptide i've taken has worked exactly the way it was told to like i can't even believe even the i know some people are taking that ozempic right you know talking about the uh it's um 
uh, semaglutide. It makes you just, oh, yeah. you just don't want to eat. Yeah, I have that. You just don't eat. Well, I still eat. Yeah, but, but I'm saying, but I'm like, it doesn't like, it's not like Fen Fen where you're like twitching and shit or you don't feel nauseous. You're yeah. just like the necessity to eat is just not, is there as much. Well, and you know, so like, this is like kind of the conversation that I had that convinced me to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about all the same things you're talking about, but um, at the end of the day, the thing that I couldn't grasp my head around was like, well, once you get on TRT, you're on it for life, mm. right? And I'm like, I mean, dude, I don't want to be like on this for life. And then I started to think, well, what else am I on for life? Mm. And I was like, I have to take protein every day. I have to work out, you know, freaking every day almost. I have to maintain my calories. I have to um, take all my supplements I take already, just the normal vitamins and stuff. I'm like, I'm already on things for life. Like, what difference is this? Yeah. And so at that point, logically, I could not find a reason not to do it. And I said, all right, well... Let's try it out. And now, you know, like I said, it's only been five weeks and I'm already up eight, nine pounds. Um, you know, from the last time I saw you at the office, like I've gained already a lot of weight and I'm just thinking, okay, this industry is like growing rapidly because people didn't even know about this stuff five years ago. Mm. Right. So now I'm like, all right, this is a new business opportunity. Like, you know, there's just so much to it. And it's like truly helping a lot of people. Yeah, it is pretty great. Yeah, and there's a difference between going to see an endocrinologist and then going to see a uh, TRT doctor. Endocrinologist is totally fine with you with a total test level of 200. But yeah. I'm like, what if I want to have sex with my wife? I'm not going to have sex <laughs> with my wife at 200, yeah. right? It's like, oh, well, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get uh, prostate cancer. I'm like, yeah, but I want to have sex with my wife. I want to run yeah. a business though. Can I get, can we get up to 600? And that, yeah, and that's the point too, where it's like, well, the acceptable range is, you know, 250 to 900. And it's like, what's that? 250 to, dude, yeah. 250, I would be so fat and depressed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's just me. Some people can do fine on 250, but like, I, I just can't. Yeah. I mean, when I first um, got, I got a blood test for the first time when I was 33. Mm -hmm. And before I took any, I wasn't taking any multis, any DHEA, I wasn't taking anything. And my test was like 350. Mm. And I was like, I'm fine. Like, I, I still crush it. I film all my content. Yeah. I still lift heavy weights. Like, I'm good. And, I naturally got it up to like 500 with just all these um, Amazon yeah. supplements, yeah. right? And then I was like, well, let's see what happens. And so, you know, now I don't know where my levels are at now. Wait till week 10 and then tell me how you feel. Message me after week 10 and tell me how you feel. Okay. It, it was to, at week 10, at, at that point, I was like, I want to go play football again. <laughs> I am ready to play tackle in a high school football game right now. What my team has told me, they're like, bro, you're way more intense than you used to be. Yeah. And not like aggressive, but he's like, they're like, you're just intense and yeah. like focused. And it's funny because my, one of my partners, I met him in 2018 and he was like, that was what he told me back in 2018. He's like, bro, you were such an intense person back then. You've really kind of like, I guess, mellowed out. Yeah. Um, he's like, dude, you're like super intense again. And it made me think, I was like, well, I was just coming out of baseball, mm. you know, where I'm like, ultra competitive and like probably my T was way higher back then. And now, you know, you, I, I don't want to say you get complacent, but I don't really get to compete and like really go yeah. dominate. The other thing is the number of people that stop taking like, um, well, it's not Ritalin. What's it called? Um, Adderall. Yeah. When they get on TRT, they stop taking Adderall. They just don't need because the ability to focus. Yeah. A lot of people just stop needing, needing that stuff. Yeah. And it's like things like Adderall, once again, I don't know the side effects and everything, but it's just like, to me, Adderall doesn't seem that, that great for you. Yeah, it's got caffeine and stuff. It's a stimulant, yeah. right? The yeah. TRT is not a stimulant. So it is really interesting. But yeah, like there's, there are times when I'm like, it doesn't make me aggressive. It makes me very calm and extremely focused. Exactly. But also like, it does make me competitive. Exactly. Right? And I like, so now for my in-person coaching, we play basketball and these guys are beating the crap out of each other. It's so fun. I make my sales team compete with me. It's so, <laughs> so fun. Um, yeah, awesome, man. All right, so I would love to go longer, but I can't because I got another call here in a little bit and I'm super happy we finally got to connect. Yeah. And I've been obviously following a lot of your stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people, you're one of the first names that come up when, when people are like, because uh, I, I realized you lived here. Um, so it was really awesome to get to pick your brain about, you know, where I think you're, you're obviously a little further than me, but like going through similar situations, especially when it comes to like a sales team or mm -hmm. advertisement or stuff like that. Um, and it's really great to go to, to, 
converse with more like-minded people who are kind of in the same situation. Because when I go back home to the East Dallas, I d can't have these conversations. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. You know, my buddy who like he went to jail, he's like, he doesn't really understand what a sales team is. Yeah. So it's a different type it's of like, conversation. like, what are you selling? Yeah, what are you selling? <laughs> That's how I ended up in jail. Yeah. From, from selling. Uh, anyway, man, great to talk to you. Um, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, anywhere on the internet, man. I mean, uh, social media is everywhere. And um, you know, like you mentioned, I got the Wealthy Way podcast and we have you know, books, courses, and all that for free at wealthyway.com that people can access. Yeah, it is great. You give away a ton of stuff for free. Move yeah. the free line. Yep. Yeah, if you're, if you're I've, I've had people hit me up about this too. They're like, they think they can't give away their best stuff for free. Mm -hmm. And if you think that you have some proprietary information that I can explain in two sentences that, that you're building a business around, you don't have it. Yeah. You don't. It's like you said, it's the, the most important thing. It's the feedback, it's the accountability. It's the, uh, it's also the one-on-one -on -one coaching I also think is a big, big deal and the community, yeah. right? Those things you can't just steal yeah. the on video. So that's awesome, man. A lot of people don't even really know what the war room is. Not only is it the greatest network in the world, but it's also like a finishing school for a man to fully develop. You know, we talk about style, stocks, making money, your relationship with your girl.